Welcome to Video Church. This is hour two of our New Year's Eve service, and a few things have occurred that we'd like to fill you in on. Now, don't get too excited. <laughs> it's not the rapture. <laughs> that doesn't happen, and we don't see it happening anytime soon in 2016. Of course, there's not much time left for 2016. So, all you false teachers and false prophets that predicted anything before 2016, wrong. <laughs> you probably already noticed that hour two is different than hour one. Because we're talking about Israel this hour, and we're talking about what is and isn't right possibly about the nation Israel, as opposed to the children of Israel, or in this case, the sons and daughters that are born in the land of Israel. Now, I might be able to talk a little bit about that because I lived there for a little while, about 14 months before I decided, I don't want to live here. <laughs> it's a nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. And that's the truth. I do not. I'm an American. I do not want to live in Israel. Maybe some of you do. Maybe some of you think it's a wonderful experience. Uh, I enjoyed a certain amount of time that I spent there, and some of it was pretty challenging. But before we get into it, we wanted to mention some things about what's going on in this hour, which last hour was an hour and 30 minutes or 24 minutes, something like that. And due to the overrun, we also had some technical difficulties. Have you ever watched that? You know, I mean, you're watching a football game, and suddenly there's, you know, when the game goes off, and, you know, there's this fuzzy screen, and it's a uh, voice in the background says, uh, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Please stand by. Well, that's kind of what we knew was going to happen with recording the New Year's Eve service, specifically for 2017 through 2034, our prophecy foretelling and our prophecy forthtelling and our prophecy viewing and reviewing. Because we don't call it an update because there's nothing to update. If you notice, most people are talking about their prophecy updates. Well, you know, we got to add something new or we got to change something that was messed up. And sometimes that's what they do in their prophecy updates. If you review what you've seen them do, you might see that there's been some changes along the way. They might have started off saying that there was an Antichrist that was from Europe. Now they'll be saying, oh, he's not from Europe, he's from Muslim country, you know, Islam. He's from, you know, like, hey, Baghdad. Uh-uh. Here, in Video Church, what we said from the beginning, we have said all along, and we will say until the end. And that is, not only is Jesus coming, which is what we've always said when we got saved, but Jesus is coming, yes, Jesus is coming, sooner than you think. He's knocking at your door. He's right around the corner. Are you listening? He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. Because God is speaking all the time. All you need to do is be listening whenever you choose to have ears to hear. That expression means whenever you choose to take the time, to make the time, to realign your schedule, to calm yourself and your spirit and your soul, and bring your flesh into subjection so that you'll be still, you'll sit still, and you'll... Huh? Listen. Now, talking about in this next hour is going to be a little discombobulated for some. If you're used to some preacher standing up, you know, in front of a pulpit with, you know, surrounded by musicians, you know, singing and praising and doing hour upon hour of worship so that you can get yourself ready, so that you can feel the presence of the Lord, so that you can hopefully get hyped up, you know, and wired up in order to, uh, you know, somehow make your flesh catch up with your spirit that you might be in tune with and in touch with God, you need to go somewhere else. <laughs> it ain't happening here. 
here we got something news for you. It's great news, it's good news, but there's some bad news. You see, I'm not going to lie to you. The end is near. Jesus is coming sooner than you think, but that doesn't mean that's good news for everyone. On the one hand, if you're going to heaven, it's great news. On the other hand, if you're going into great tribulation, that's bad news. On the other hand, if you're in great tribulation and you're saved, that's good news. On the other hand, if you're in great tribulation and saved, you're going to die. You can take that as a bad news, good news thing, because the good news is you get out of the great tribulation, or the bad news is, well, anyway, you die. <laughs> you figure that one out. So, in this study, this hour, we're not going to go through, you know, line by line upon dot, tittle, thistle, thistle, and everything else. But someone did comment about last hour how we talked about the shadow of things to come and where was America in prophecy. We'll review that a little bit. Or is American prophecy? Where is American prophecy? That's what we'll review. It's going to probably be a little disconcerting <coughs> if I have to get up and do some things because of the technical difficulties in the first hour, but you pretty much know video ministry by now, hopefully. If not, welcome. I'll mention my credentials a little bit. I'll mention what video ministry and video church is and where we're going a little bit, you know, about 2017. And, you know, if we last through 2017, 80% chance um, that we won't. But, you know, we'll talk about that, the probability factors of when the Lord's return is going to happen and how no man knows the day or the hour may be true, but you can know within probably 72 hours, pretty close. But the point being, we'll get into that. Maybe third hour, maybe fourth hour, maybe this hour. We'll, you know, briefly touch on those things as we go along. But the technical difficulties were such that we've been wanting to break this up instead of it being just one four-hour service. We wanted to, as it were, prepare you for all the other pastors out there and preachers and prophecy scholars or pastor, prophecy pastor, teacher, your favorite, whoever it is that's doing whatever they're doing in order to accomplish whatever it is they're supposed to accomplish. And we're going to mention that because that's going to have a lot to do with Israel today. It's going to have a lot to do with what you see and hear and understand today. You see, the spirit of prophecy is all about Jesus. And I mean all about Jesus. Not a little bit, not so, not a little bit here, a little bit there, and line upon line or something, but the entire book. You see, Jesus made a bold, brash statement that, frankly, ought to put some legalists and some, you know, kind of like, you're going to hear about a lot of Hebrew um, Israelis, uh, Hebrew Israelites, you know, that are a cult, but you're going to hear a lot about them in the coming days because what's happening now is that what has been sown to the wind, the whirlwind is causing to bear fruit. What has been allowed to come to fruition is there's a lot of freedom in America that maybe wasn't quite what God intended when he gave us grace and shed his grace upon me. We in America are the greatest exporter of cults and false teachings in the world. Now, that's bad news. Should bring condemnation. Should make some of those guys that, you know, like to wham, bam, and slam, you know, America, jump up and shout, you know, and spring from the mountaintops. But what's on the mountaintops is those who have their footprints imprinted on there that bring glad tidings of good joy, you know, that are proclaiming peace or publishing peace, that have something good to say and not something bad. Because I can tell you the facts, but I can also tell you the good news, the great news, as we like to say here at Video Church. The fact is, though America is the cesspool of cults, reviving them, polishing them up, sending them out, and causing them to get more followers in the world than they ever would have gotten, except for we did it. We're also the number one nation for sending out missionaries. We do more in helping out disasters 
than other nation ever planned for. You see, there's a lot about being the land that God shed his grace upon that manifest itself in the actions of the people that have felt that grace upon. I myself am a sinner saved by grace. My salvation is by grace and not of myself. It is a gift that God has given to me that I employ in my life daily, that I need in my life hourly. I need it so much so that I would say every breath I take and every move I make, it isn't just breathe in and breathe out Jesus. It's about God forgive me. Or sometimes I know what I'm doing. Sometimes not so much. Such a deal. What can we say? Israel. What we can say. Yes, that's what we're going to be talking about this hour. Israel. We're going to be talking about how God used, as we said in the first hour, the nation of Israel as a example or a shadow of things to come. They are a people that, if you look at them, you will see Christians. Yeah, really, seriously. You can see Christian Pharisees in the nation of Israel. You can, or in the people of Israel, uh, the Jewish people. Um, nation of Israel, children of Israel, however you want to look at it. You can see Christian religious type people in the Sadducees, or as we like to say today, in the Orthodox, or in the Chabadniks, or the Lubavitchers, or the Satmeyer Jews. You can see most of Israel not religious, just like you can see in America, most of America not religious. We like to say we are, but if you added up the percentages of people in Sunday, most of them are watching football. You know, they're really not into church. I mean, it used to be, it could be, but it's not quite what it was. So, the same is true about Israel. On the one hand, you look at Israel and you think, oh, everybody's religious because you see some Orthodox that looks so obviously religious. Is he or isn't he? Now, I lived in community with Chabad, and I know that a lot of the people that are in, Jewish people that are in Chabad, they, they may be religious, but that doesn't mean they believe in God. They believe in a type of humanism, a type of self-help kind of philosophy that the Catholics also, if you look at a lot of Catholic priests, do they all believe in God? Eh, you define their God and you're going to find they probably believe more in humanism and socialism and uh, psychology and sociology than they do in God Almighty. Now that doesn't mean every Catholic is you know, atheist, doesn't mean every Jew is atheist, but a lot are. And sadly, that's what the nation of Israel has always been. An example, a light to the nation. It doesn't mean it's a good light, it doesn't mean it's a bad light, it just means that Look and see and learn. We're told that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night, when thou risest up, when thou sittest down, when thou walkest along, when thou talkest, when thou thinkest, when, when thou doest anything. Literally. And that's why you see Jews all the time going around going da 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 you know, bouncing this way and bouncing that way, because the idea was to be always in Praying always, so they believed every part of the body must be praying in its conjunction with the mind and the soul and the body. So you're always kind of going like this, you're dobbing and then you're weaving and then you're bobbing and then you're kind of like, you know, stepping this and stepping that and stepping forward and stepping back because you want to do honor and justice to everything that's around. And really, it's exhausting if you're not Jewish. If you're Jewish, yeah, it makes kind of sense, but you know, it's kind of goofy too. So, Talking about these things in relationship to prophecy means that we have to understand the focus. The focus isn't Israel. It's not the nation Israel. It's not about, like we wanted to say in the first hour, I just realized I didn't say it. It's not about you, and it's not about them, but it's about him. Now, I did say, I remember that it's not about me and you, and it's about him, but really, prophecy is not about America. And it's not about Israel. Israel is a timepiece. It's an example. It's something that is being used as God said he would use these people as his chosen to be revealed for why he chose them. Which wasn't simply to, hey, guess what? You're going to have Jesus. That's not it. All of the children of Israel are revealing to us something we can learn from. You see Saul? King Saul? Yeah, you know, Saul that was... The children of Israel decided, hey, we don't want to be ruled by God. We don't want to follow this prophet of God. Kind of like what they said to Moses when they got delivered. 
but they're talking to Samuel. And he said, you know what? All the other nations, they got kings. All the other nations, they, they, they got this really cool setup. You know, they got this big palace, you know, and you can, you know, pay your five bucks, get in, you know, kind of like the Magic Kingdom. You know, you get in, you get entertained, and then if you don't get entertained, the king kills you. Well, they kind of felt like, you know, they were left out somehow. At least that nation of the children of Israel were whining, complaining. Samuel took it personal. God said, don't worry about it. Rejecting you, they've rejected me. Think about that when you think about government. You see, the government will be upon his shoulders, Jesus, and principalities and other things, but he will be the one who will be head above his shoulders in control. There's only one king, and that is Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. There will not be another king coming. You don't get to pick and choose and decide who is going to govern you. God is the governance. Now, in this world <clears throat> that we live in, which is why we're studying prophecy, we are under, <clears throat> <clears throat> literally, the influence and affluence of the God of this world. Satan, Lucifer, the morning, once called the morning star. He's no longer the morning star, but he was once called that. He is a angel only. He's not God-like. He doesn't have the ability of God to create things or do things or kill things. Satan can't kill you. He can get you to a place where you wind up doing yourself in. But he can't kill you. God won't let Satan literally kill you. Suicides, <coughs> very few of them, but a great majority at the same time, are influenced by satanic powers and principalities. They set up the circumstances where a person feels hopeless, helpless, and they decide to do themselves in because they see that there's no other outlet to be relieved of what they're feeling oppressed from. That's it. Now, are there people possessed? Sure. But any of the people that were possessed didn't die. The pigs died when they were possessed, but literally in Jesus' time, people that were possessed, they kept being tortured by that possession. In other words, that's the way it works. It's not Satan is some kind of God that can kill things. No. That's not the way it works. That's not spiritual reality. That's deception. Make oh. But there is a time coming in the Great Tribulation where God steps back. Where God steps out, where literally those possessed by evil, which is what Satan is manifested of, evil, that people will be able to do what they want to do in killing each other. Today, we do that in what we call righteous wars, which aren't righteous. We do that in protective of ourselves, which isn't right. We say we're doing right, but we take a soul, we take a life. Is that what God intended when he said, love your enemy? No. He said, you die, let them live. I'll deal with them. Well, that ain't fair. No, it's not. It's called being under and controlled by God, not man. See, if you want justice, go to man and you can go through the justice system. If you want reality of truth, God is in control. You're going to live forever. Why are you worried about dying? If you didn't worry about dying, you don't care about self-protection. If you're worried about dying, it means you know you're not saved, and you're worried about going to hell. You're not worried about dying, you're worried about hell if it's real. So, in this then, getting ready to talk about the worship of Israel, the worship of the people, we want to remind ourselves all the way through this study that it's not about the children of Israel being perfect, because today, we have a lot of Christian churches that are out there saying, oh, you know, bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee and they'll be cursed. Hey, you know what? God damn Israel and you're not going to go to hell. You know what I mean? That's not how it works. And yet, we have a lot of Christians that think that's the way it works. I myself personally just recently in Utah had that experience of super Jew, which is what we call it, where some, God knows some Calvary pastor decided that, hey, you know what? We don't talk about Israel because, you know, we could wind up, you know, on the wrong side of God. Why? God says they're blessed when they are right, and they're cursed when they are wrong, and that if he tells you to say something, say something. Jesus didn't come up and say, hey, wonderful lost children of Israel, you're doing great, you're fantastic, here's this temple, I love it, wonderful architecture, man, I can't wait to go in and just be, you know, the king of kings for you. No, he blasted them. He 
He said, you don't even know who your father is. Sadly, today, that's the way the same thing is, even though God is using the nation. It's not about them doing right. It's about their wrong, and he's going to send the law and the prophets to prove it to them. Literally. The law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah are coming, and we know it's Moses and Elijah because they're being sent to Israel to witness to Israel, to witness to the people of the law, the people of the prophets, the people of the book. So, in this then studying, this is what I wanted to, you know, kind of, somebody said, well, you know, man, you know, that last hour and a half, you didn't even open up your Bible. Well, really? Do I need to? I mean, come on. You know, all these are just simply about <clears throat> the millennial kingdom. <clears throat> one topic, <clears throat> one subject. Little tabs of every scripture that apply to the millennial kingdom. When I was writing the book, um, Thousand Years, Genesis Age, this was my references. So, whether you accept the fact that, like a Jew, we can sit around and talk, because what we'll be doing in video church and video ministry in 2017 to 2034 is telling you facts. We're not here to save you. I mean, God knows I'd love you to be saved. You know what I mean? You want to get saved? Good. Call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Bingo, bingo, bongo, boom. Say, sort of. It's kind of like, you know, the quote-unquote revivals that are going out. You know, how many revivals and how many people are saved? Well, everyone's already been saved according to the revival number. I don't know if you realize that, but if you've added up the revival number, even given the birth of new people in the nation, everybody got saved. I mean, if you add up the Calvary chapels, the Baptists, the Pentecostals, the the free whatever everybody's and you know the other kind of people you know and everyone's you know kind of quote unquote numbers the Billy Graham numbers and you know those guys numbers and this guy's numbers man where are the sinners I mean it doesn't take a genius to figure out the sinners are like right in your own home you but also where are the sinners that you know supposedly aren't saved reality is they're right next door to you too because they didn't get saved. The numbers lie. While they throw out a net, which we call evangelism, and pull in everything, that doesn't mean everyone got saved just because they went forward and said, focus, focus, this is how we get saved. You know, that I got to confess my sins, I have to repent of my sins, I have to feel bad, I have to look bad, I have to say bad, I have to be bad in order that I could be good so that God could come down in and save me and I could read my Bible every day and I could be in a church, you know, and I could just go, woohoo, I'm going to heaven. I don't know about you, but if the volume of the book is about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation and nothing changed, why are we not taking up our cross and following Jesus? Was that then and this is now? I don't know. The book of Revelation says, hey, you know what? I like your works. You know, one of the letters to the seven churches, you can look it up. I like what you're doing here. And he said to another church, I like what you're doing there. He says, hey, I like this, I like that. But I got a few things that aren't right. One of them for one of the churches was, hey, you left your first love. I know God speaks. I know we don't listen. Those are facts. I mean, that's just, God spoke to Abraham, to Moses. To, I mean, you name a name and God spoke to them at some point in time all the way through the scriptures even into Revelation. And yet, we're the nation that says, well, you know, God doesn't speak that way. He works through the church now. You know, he talks through the pastor. You know, we got to clarify something. You know, we're not anti-church. You know, we're not anti-religion. We're not anti-anything. As a matter of fact, you know, I mean, we're pro-Jesus. Because if you are in a church, whether it be a Catholic, a Protestant, a Mormon, a Jehovah's Witness, the Church of Lucifer, or wherever you may be, that doesn't stop God from speaking. I mean, what stops God from speaking is your ears, if you aren't hearing. Because God never stops speaking. We look in the book of Revelation and we find something interesting about what's going on. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, who was it is and is to come. In other words, there's always a 
audible worship service going on 24-7. Yeah. Matter of fact, some of the beings that are there are so created that they would not stop worshiping 24-7. They don't have to take a potty break. They're not made that way. Sorry. It's true. They're angelic beings. They're not the angels that you think of as cherubim and seraphim and come flying down and, you know, give you some kind of blessing. There are a lot of people that are Christians that think that, you know, some angel is going to come, you know, and like just, you know, you get turned into an angel, you earn your wings, or, you know, somehow that somehow your, your guardian angel is going to be one of those that fly down. <laughs> Abraham didn't entertain some angel with wings on. He entertained three people that came into his camp. One of them happened to be the Lord of hosts. We knowing what that title means, know that it is the Messiah because he came at that time to Abraham. Now, theologians are going to call call it a pre-incarnate whatever, and they're going to call it this, that, or the other thing. It's what the Bible says. That's all. Just, it says it. You don't understand it. That's okay. God didn't say you would. Leave it at that. So, what we're doing in Vidigo Church in 2017 is we're posting everything that this New Year's Eve service is an overview of, an underrated overview, but still, we know a lot about the soon return of Jesus. He said a lot about his coming again. He didn't say that you won't know. He said, look, watch and be ready. For if the man who had broken into the house had known at what hour he was coming, he would have prepared himself. So too with you. Don't you know that the end of the world has come and you are either ready and getting more ready or you are looking more and more like you don't believe it in the first place? I can tell you, frankly, most churches don't believe in the second coming and teach it anyways. They have programs that are going to last for the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. They want you to invest in your IRA. Their 301k, you know, their 301c, whatever, non-profit. They want you to make money, save money, have money, and do money so that you can be prepared for your retirement days. It ain't going to happen. Invest now. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. You want a retirement? Hey, I got news for you. Eternity is your retirement. This world is not. Prepare for yourself to live in this world, and you are a what? Love the world more than you love Jesus. Invest now in Jesus good. And I'm not saying buy some pastor's salary, you know, cap, or get into some worship team so that you could, you know, or get into some support of the church so you could have some wonderful worship team and spend thousands upon thousands of dollars upon your sound equipment, your worship service, your training, and everything else so that Jesus could say, huh. Pretty impressive. It's all going to burn. Now, how did you worship? Well, Lord, I went to church on Sunday. No, how did you worship? Worship in spirit and truth? Did you, like, wake up in the morning and say, Praise ye the Lord, his mercy endures forever and ever. You know, kind of like, I'm a morning person, so I get pretty hyped up in the morning. You know, kind of like wound up and like, yeah, oh boy, let's go for it. But worship in spirit and truth meant you are doing it. Wherever you are, as you are, the way you are, now, today, this moment, we could stop and just keep praising the Lord. And he would inhabit it, and we would be blessed by it. Not because we're going to start singing, but because God inhabits praises. Praises doesn't have to be song. Right now we're into worshiping the worship, and that's a whole other hour of talking about prophecy. But in Vinibo Church, as we keep going forward and back to that name, Vidivo Church is going to be posting all of the prophecies, all of them, throughout 2017. It's not going to be like, if you were expecting in this four hour period to hear, you know, all of, you know, something that proves to you that Jesus is coming, you won't get it. Because, frankly, there isn't enough books, hours, days that I could talk even. Much less that is out there and available to you to prove that Jesus is coming because the proof is in the life you're living. You are a living example of his coming. Look how bad you are at times. Look how good you are. Is it getting better or worse? Sign of his coming. You can look at yourself and your family and your home and your heart and pretty much 
if you just looked at what Jesus said about what would be the sign of his coming, you could find it in yourself, really. I mean, it starts in the home, in your mirror, and you can begin to see, yeah, check that one off. Loving kindness, peace, meekness, no, temperance, gentleness, in increasing measure, or are we on a declination going downhill fast? I know where I'm at. Lord have mercy. So, in these days that are coming of watching and being ready, at the same time, we'll present things that you can, if you didn't know about prophecy, you'll be able to see them. We have material from Chuck Missler, we have material from Chuck Smith, we have material from everyone, including what I say. You know, because I'm going to tell you that some of the things that have been told you about the rapture are false. There are certain scriptures that you think are part of the rapture that aren't. They're about the second coming, yeah, but they're not about the rapture, no. You've been told that there's a rapture disaster going to happen. And I'm going to tell you that's the biggest mythology that's happened for the rapture. I'm going to tell you that, yes, I believe in a snatching away of a certain amount of people, but that doesn't mean that I think that I'm going to be sitting here and poof, you're going to see my clothes collapse and I'm going to be, you know, flying up naked into the air and suddenly change and a robe comes flying over me, you know, while I'm getting dressed, you know, kind of like backstage at some musical production that's going to happen in the sky. No! I don't know where we got that, but I know that people made that up because how stupid it sounds if you were practical. And that's why you don't see people getting saved by telling them they're going to get zapped. The rapture zapper, you know, it's going to come along and zap, 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 and poof, poof, poof. And then all of a sudden there's a great revival afterwards because all these clothes are sitting around and the Salvation Army is collecting them. Hmm. You know, the, the imagery was nice, but that wasn't the reality. So we'll talk about that. But that's the point of it being that there's a lot of misappropriation of Scripture, misapplication of the Word of God, mistaken imagery that people have conveyed by popular preaching, Book sales, we know some famous ones that have sold the idea, and all America caught on to it. Um, prophecy seminars, pay your ten bucks, hey, why not free? You know, I mean, come on, why do you have to get paid? Freely receive, freely give. We don't get money here at Digimo Church, never have, never will. In over 40 years, never going to get it. Now it's pretty easy to say no to somebody trying to give me some money, or say, honey, you know, let me just pay for this. Oh, yeah. God will take care of it. So, in the coming days, from January 1st, 2017 onward, you will sometimes see some missler videos, like especially the uh, 24 hours of the Bible. You know, that's a pretty safe one for most people. Book of Revelation probably will be part of missler studies, you know, that we present. There's a lot of things, like I did from Chuck Smith, Hal Lindsey, um, other pastors and teachers that are still correct that weren't false and haven't been proven false, like Peggy's been proven false, Jonathan Kahn has been proven false, um, Franklin Graham has kind of gone off on a tangent into politics, you know what I mean? There are different people that have gone off. And in the coming years of 2017, we call it the year of separation because in one degree, people are going to go off. They're going to turn to the left or the right, one degree. You're going to see them just, at the beginning of the year, slowly turn from what they were excited about, Jesus coming, to, well, yeah, Jesus coming. And then by the end of the year, I don't think he's coming. One degree. Because when you start with one degree in a moonshot, if you were trying to hit the moon, just one degree off in your calculations and, you know, looking at it, you go, well, I can see right dead center, now I'm going to move it just over a notch. One degree. You'll miss the moon. If you are one of those gun enthusiasts and you're a hunter, you don't set your sights one degree to the left or the right. You set it dead on. You see, that's what sin is. It's called missing the mark. It means to be hit bullseye. Perfectly in the center. Dead on. Right on. Perfect. Mature. 100%. That's why we talk about the coming of the Lord as being probability. Because we're not 100% on which year. We're probable of which year. Now, 100% will be when we're there. Because then we're there. But... Till then, probability. 
One degree of separation is what's going to happen in your relationship with the Lord. You're either going to be moving one degree closer or one degree farther apart. And we don't want you to go the wrong degrees which way. We want you to be closer onward than outward. We want you to be focused more upward than downward. We want you to see where the error of your ways may have been, and you can read this and see it for yourself and study for yourself, so we're not the one telling you that you somehow come to us and say, oh, hey, how can I find this field that you got? It's been there all along. We haven't said anything new. Matter of fact, the charts that we'll be presenting are from Claire Barkin, and he wrote them back in the 1900s. And that's where all the modern prophecy scholars get their charts from. Yes, they do. They steal it, they lie about it, they get it, they reconvert it, or they just post it. Me, I know, we can post it. We don't get money, we never had money, we don't promote money, and we don't take money. So, hey, we're not just non-profit, we're no profit. <laughs> Matter of fact, we're operating at a deficit that God keeps taking care of. <laughs> Literally. So, all of the things that we know that we have known from the beginning, we are saying unto you now, and we are going to be saying unto you until the very end. Because this is what we've been preparing for all our lives. Jesus coming again. So Video Church is about that. It's about your personal relationship with Jesus. You can still go to another church. You can still be a part of whatever you want to do. Go do what you're going to do. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. But Video Church is the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. That's what we do. We are literally only about one thing, Jesus. That's it. We're not interested in how you're going to, you know, work out tendential, you know, um, application of some false idea that you're trying to make fit into your Bible or your life or your word or your work or whatever. We're about what Jesus said. That's it. If Jesus said, these things of mine, I will tell you what they are, and here they are. And he gave us the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, if you don't do these, here's what will happen. And he said that it was like a house on set. If you do these things, here's what will happen. You'll be standing upon a rock when everything falls apart. So he wasn't telling you that you're going to get blessed and get money and get prosperous and get rich. No. What he said was, if you do these things, love your enemies, you know, and the other rest of it, you know, we'll get into that, you know, prophecy on, you know, another day. But, if you are doing these things and increasing in doing these things and continually doing these things, then this is what will happen. When the storms of life come, nothing will shake it. You won't be torn down. But God knows all you got to do is go outside and look and see how they're building things. You know that when the hurricane comes, it wipes it out. You know that if somebody's living in a mobile home, God bless them, you know, when the windstorm hits, whew, up and they're gone. Or a tornado, up and they're gone. They're just shacks. And it's a shack attack, but it wipes them all out and they're just leveled flat. That's what you put your trust in. If you're living in Tornado Alley, that's what you put your trust in. If you're living in some place that has those things. But if we put our trust in the Lord, if we literally are examining where we're at to see if we're found in the faith or outside of the faith, then it's not waiting for the pastor to come along and tell us, hey, today we're going to talk about, you know, are you really a Christian and how can you know for sure? What? What do you mean? You didn't know it all along? And now you got to be told? Please. The fact of the matter is this in prophecy. Where are you looking? Really? Where are you looking? Where are you looking? See, I'm looking at my time piece. The freckle past the hair. <laughs> That's an old, stupid joke. Where are you looking? We of the last generation, we of the Armageddon generation, we of the Jesus movement, we of those who were born after the birth of Israel are looking at Israel. Now, I'm not going to tell you you're supposed to look, you know, like <laughs> Israel. Frankly, you know, putting on a kosher cap. I'm not wearing a kippah. I don't have tzitzis, you know. Sorry, not all Jews do either. There's reform, there's conservative, there's agnostic, I mean, there's tons of varieties of expression of Jewish perspective and life. Lifestyle choices are religious application or observation, as we say. So 
some Orthodox Jews. I've lived with the Orthodox, some Orthodox Jews, you know, wear this, that, and the other thing, and do this, that, and the other thing, and guess what? That's just a lifestyle choice. Some Christians want to do that now, and unfortunately, some of them are cultists. Sacred neighbors are a cult. They say yayas, you know, like they're yo-yos, you know, and that somehow they're going to just keep, like, you know, flicking it up and flicking it out and flicking it around and doing it around the world. And the ticker talker, you know, that they can somehow, you know, make their yo-yo into God and that they're going to worship in some way that's better than everyone else. So they make up new languages and they call it Hebrew. <laughs> I don't know what they're listening to. I know they're false. That's easy for me. I'm Jewish. It's like, yeah. Any Jew that looks at a Yahushua, Yahuhu, or any of the other kind of uh, quote unquote legalistic, messianic kind of weirdo wackos, you know, that are wacky khakis because they're not even, even Jews for Jesus wouldn't, you know, kind of go, really? That's what you're doing? Let's just leave them alone. And, you know, I mean, a Jew just kind of go, huh, that's a Christian? No, it's not. Just so you know, it's a cult. It's not even a Christian cult. It's a cult, period. They're just wrong, way out in left field that they went out of the ballpark and created their own God. Same thing with, like, uh, Mormons. Sorry, got to say it, but it's the truth. I was in Israel at the time that Mormons were claiming to be the lost tribe of Israel, and I remember when Mormons used to come to my door when I was a kid and tell me that, you know, the Mormon Bible was the New Bible of the Americas, and that all those Incas, or all the Incas, yeah, the Incas and the Aztecs, and they were all, you know, like really Mormons, you know, and that they jumped from Egypt and come over the land. Somehow they, you know, shot across from, who knows, you know, Africa to Brazil and, you know, worked their way up and, you know, worked their way down and worked their way around. And somehow this was, you know, like the, the great Quetzalcoatl, you know, that was the sun god that was really Jesus who visited during the time that he's missing in the Bible, and this just sort of fills in the Bible and makes the Bible better and more complete. And I went, Oh, I read it and I went, oh, <laughs> I mean, even as a kid, I didn't buy the notion. And now there's a whole different, you know, philosophy behind it and business behind it. And, you know, kind of like, quote, unquote, we're a family institution. Well, yeah, okay, you know, so are the Orthodox and so are the Chinese and so are the Mexicans. I mean, there are a lot of family institutions that are pretty right on for family, but it doesn't mean I want to be one. And frankly, when I heard that the Mormons were teaching about, and then I researched it myself to find out about what they think God is, I went, that's not Christian. There's not even a close resemblance to anything Christian. And yet they imitate everything that's Christian to get you in, to get you caught up in what they're doing, so that you're never paying attention to what the truth is. If I need the Book of Mormon, believe me, what happened to the Bible? If I need the Pearl of Great Price, what happened to the Bible? If I need Doctrine of the Covenant, what happened to the Bible? In other words, I don't need any of that. I got the Bible. So if I read the Bible and the Bible says, I don't need any of that, then I don't need any of that. That's simple. I'm Jewish. I think that way. So because we have so many obvious things that are wrong out there, we need to recognize where we look. looking. You know, when you look at Israel, what do you see? What do you see? Well, you know. Do you see a nose? <laughs> Didn't see that coming, did you? Come on now. If I come knocking on your door, you don't see my nose coming? Yes, you do. So, what do you see when you see Israel? On the one hand, God, such a deal. Oi, you know, if I were a rich man, is that what you see? Fiddler on the roof? I mean, uh, nothing wrong with seeing Fiddler on the roof. Such a deal. You're looking at Israel. I remember, we keep saying Israel. We're not saying Jew. What do you see? New York? I mean, there is fashion in New York. There's passion in New York. There's crime in New York. There's, you know, like uh, the Empire State Building, you know, Statue of Liberty. But there's also Crown Heights. There's also a certain amount of Jewish community in New York. We came up with an expression that describes one type of Jew in New York that is feminine. We call them Japs. 
and that's not to knock Japanese, and it's not to slam Jews. We call them Jewish American princesses because they are Jewish American princesses. Believe me. We're talking money, honey. <laughs> yeah. And you ain't going to get to square one without some money, honey. You know, you better have something in the bank account besides your baggage, you know, and your IOU. So, New York has one vision of what they think Israel is, and they have a perspective of it. Sometimes they go, hey, let's do somewhere in, you know, in, uh, in lot. Yeah, you know, we could go down to a lot, you know, and have a boat, you know, party, and, you know, kind of like do our time, jump back on the jet, and go back to New York. No time at all. New York, you. Tuvia was rather a poor man. He wanted to be a rich man. New York Jew was a rich man. He didn't want to be poor. These are Jews. These are real. These are people that these stories that I'm telling you are examples of what different perspectives are from Jewish people. Of Jewish people. In between, there's a whole lot of Jews. A small percentage are saved. Jews for Jesus, chosen people, uh, Hebrew for Christians, Zola Levitt. Um, I can name a lot of Jews, you know, because I met them. You know, um, Scott Brown, uh, chosen people. Um, you know, quite a few. I mean, there's Jonathan Kahn. I mean, if you want cults, believe me, we Jews we create cults faster than anyone else. Jonathan Kahn is one of the biggest con games that was ever presented on America that fast. The guy was, you know, like involved in a kind of like a little tiny shul, you know, kind of a messianic little group, you know, that had got together. And they, you know, they weren't doing too well. So suddenly he jumped out of that and goes into the circuit. You know, oh, Jewish this, that, and the other thing. 9-11 had, you know, this kind of like tree of life, you know. What? You know, America is in prophecy. You know, here, let me show you. What? I've got a piece of the cross. Let me sell it to you. What? Well, you know, we're talking about Israel. If you go to Israel today, I can take you to a lot of stalls that will sell you a piece of the cross. Some that are owned by Jews, some that are owned by, you know, Israeli Arabs. There are Israeli Arabs. Don't go into this Palestine thing. Because, frankly, you know, when you start saying Palestinians aren't Palestinians because they're Israeli, because they weren't there, and they were there, and they aren't there, and they should have been there, but they weren't there because God was there. I got news for you. The Palestinian Times broadcast or published when Israel became a nation. Palestinians were there because they were in a part of the land that was not occupied. The part that Israel occupied was swamp land that they bought and drained it and became part of Israel. The United Nations is the one who determined the boundaries. And you can't just, when someone decides to, you know, draw a boundary, suddenly say, well, now we got to throw all those people out because God said this is Israel and it's Jewish land only. God didn't say Jewish land only. He said, look, I'm giving you this land. You move into it, you take it, you make it, but you also allow the stranger in your midst to come into the land, to be in the land, but don't follow their ways. Moses, read it. He knows this. So, knows this is knows this. What you do, Josh? Perpich? Kosher? So, with this then, of American ideology, what you see as Israel, I'm going to burst your bubble and say, no, it's not. I mean, you're going to believe it no matter what I say, so I'm not going to even bother to you know, try to convince you because you don't live there. And you haven't lived there, and you haven't, maybe some of you have gone there and you thought that it was wonderful, and you thought, oh, my tour guide got saved. <laughs> Why does that sound like a used car salesman? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, the current president. You know, do you believe that stuff? Yeah, he got saved again and again and again. Every tour he gets saved, you know. You know, I, I remember um, living in Israel. I was going to, um, <laughs> gosh, I was going to meet, I think it was, I was leaving our, our, this woman's house who was an Israeli gypsy. Now, this is one of those people that you say don't belong in the land, can't have the land, aren't Palestinian, aren't, you know, Israeli citizens because they're not Jewish. It just so happens she's an Israeli gypsy that's a Christian and a born-again Christian and her family has been that way for about four generations. Living in Jerusalem over four generations. That's longer than Americans been around. Living in Jerusalem. She wasn't one of the people kicked out. She's one of the people still there. You might call her a Samaritan. It wouldn't be that far off. 
but she's a gypsy. Legitimate gypsy. Yeah. I went to go visit her, and I was one of the ones that at that time was helping the groups that were coming together to get her recognized by the state of Israel so she could get Israeli rights and privileges because she was working in the motels and the hotels and her hands were all burned up from the corruption, you know, and they were paying her under the table because, you know, if you're not quote unquote recognized by the state of Israel, you know, you're kind of like a green card holder, but you know, because you're already living there, you've got citizenship, but you don't get some of the rights and privileges because there is more than a two class system in Israel. There's us and them. And some people in the government do that. And some people in Israel do that. It is very sectarian. It is not a democracy. If you think it is, you keep saying it is, but it's not. And if you live there, you know that. It just is crazy there. Crazy. And it's getting crazy. So, seeing that it is a interesting land, you know, of confluences of people influencing and having affluence, meaning money, I was visiting her and I came across this, uh, you know, kind of construction going on. I was looking at it and I was like, you know, and they were just like, wow. You know, and I, I went across the line, you know, the lines over there digging. They were digging out this hole, you know, hole in the ground, you know, and they were digging it up, you know, taking dirt out and stuff, you know, and they are cementing some parts. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, oh, that's one of the pits, you know, that they were thrown into, you know, in the way back when, you know, and we're making it into a tourist site, you know, so that they can, uh, because you see, when they're talking to someone that lives there, you get a different story than you get when you get the official other story for people visiting. You know how that goes. So they say, well, you know, we're building a tourist site, you know, and they, they don't want to come here and look at a dirty hole in the ground, you know, with a lot of rocks, you know, and a lot of stick and worms and, you know, stuff. So we have to cement this all in and make it look nice, you know, and then kind of make it look old after we cement it, you know, and do all this stuff. You know, so that way we can, you know, charge people to come in. I go, so they're going to come to see, you know, some pit that they grew, you know. Well, yeah, we're, we're calling it Herod's cell where John the Baptist was thrown into and locked up. Was it? Uh, maybe. Okay. Just warning you, your antiquities may not be as antiquated as you think it is. Because a lot of what you see in Israel isn't where it is, it's down below everything that's been put on top of it. Because for tourism, you know, there's a lot of things that are somewhat accurate. You know, the, the retaining wall that you see, that we call the western wall, the whaling wall, you know, the prayer wall, or whatever you want to call it. You know, and, yeah, up above it is, you know, Temple Mount, but down below is more of the actual rocks you want to see, because remember, every stone was left unturned. So when did the stones get turned back up? Think about it for a while. A retaining wall just means it's a brick wall. That's all. Just a brick wall. There's no holiness to it. But let me clarify something. When you go there, do you feel holy? Oh, let's touch the stones that Jesus touched. Let's walk on the ground that Jesus walked on. You're not walking on the ground Jesus walked on. Matter of fact, so many people have walked on that. I don't think you could come even close to it. You know, it's down below. You know, underground, more likely, mostly. So, you know, I mean, some excavations, it's good to go see, you know, and you can see kind of a lot of things, and you can learn a lot of things, and you can imagine a lot of things, and things have been imagined for you. But, perspective-wise, when it comes to Israel, what are you looking at? Are you looking at that as holy ground, the holy land, and it's all holy? Because, you see, once you start saying, Israel is the holy land, you start sounding like a Catholic. Yeah, really. I mean, that's what happened. How did we get the word holy land put into Israel, the land and the people? Is it the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is it the people of the Bible? Is it the land of the book? Is it where you have Jew and Gentile, Arab and Israeli, Palestinian and Persian, you know, Gypsy, all living in the one place that is supposed to be the center of the universe, so to speak? New Jerusalem will be that, not old Jerusalem, but you know, still, you know, New Jerusalem being that comes down from heaven, not the one that's sitting there on earth. But still, you know, you get the idea here, I hope, you know, that you're looking at a land that has become deified in some ways by Christian Pentecostals and evangelicals to a point where it's a little absurd and disgusting. Now, it's interesting because I went to the, also to the, you know, I took some, uh, Calvary Chapel pastors 
you know, it was my day off, so to speak. Of. Um, I was there in Jerusalem with Calvary Chapel in Jerusalem before it sold, sold it, because it did, you know, with Bradley and all that, yeah, Sullivan, you know, Mariana. Um, they went back to Switzerland, I think, and they came back. Kind of, eh, long story. You know, you don't want to know the whole story. It's kind of like, you know, kind of like the good and the bad of Calvary Chapel, you know, but anyway. Um, you know, I was leaving, you know, Calvary Chapel, Jerusalem, and, um, a couple of missionaries came over from, one from Italy, one from Hawaii, and one from, uh, someplace else. Well, no, just, it was just two. It was just two. So, that was three of us. So, you know, we took off and we went north and we went to, um, the Galilee, the Galil, you know, and we went up on the mountain, you know, and we, we slept at the Beatitudes, you know, and we camped out, you know. In the morning, we, uh, baptize each other, you know, in the Sea of Galilee, and then we um, swam in it, you know, and we, uh, what else we did? We did all kinds of crazy things. So, I was talking to them, and I could see the look in their eyes, so I shared with them a lot of stories about Israel and everything else. I didn't share with them the bad news or the good news. I just shared with them, you know, this is where, what happened way back when. Now, if you look at a lot of these things, you realize that can't, oh, and we preached at the synagogue in Capernaum. Now it's not, now it's really nice, and I imagine they put fences up and poles and everything, so you can't get to where we were at. But it was still just kind of rocky. But, um, you know, we were, it was kind of cool, you know, I mean, it was something that was nice to see, but it doesn't mean that's the reality of what it is. You see, there's this idea of seeing things with golden eyes, you know, or with golden glasses, meaning that when you're looking at Israel, do you see it as the reality of what it is now, or what it was then. See, I could see what it was, and then I lived what it is, and I knew by prophecy what it was going to become. Hell on earth. Don't look at Israel and think that it's going to be some golden utopian society. It's not. Today it is not. There are people that are being oppressed. There are people that are being abused. Frankly, if there's a nation of people that I would rather be a part of and not be oppressed, it would be America because Israel isn't that way. There's Jewish reverse discrimination going on all the time about a lot of people. Settlers are killing Jews over the land they want to settle and take over and make their own little kingdom of Israel. The same way that those Orthodox Jews that are sitting in Meishurim don't let the government in. Radical extremists. Yeah, they are They will shoot you. Well, they won't shoot you because they don't believe in using guns. But they will stone you with stones, rocks. And you'll die and get killed. Literally. If you go to Maya Shireen. It's called a thousand gates because yeah, it's a long story. It's kind of like um, the mystical orthodox. And then some guy from Israel, you know, that will come out of there for some whatever reason will become a legendary hero over here and start prophesying and somehow, you know, Americans will start buying into it. Even if he's wrong. And that's the problem with what we do with looking at Israel. Are we looking at what Jesus saw? Or are we looking at what we see? And that's why we wanted to bring this hour up about Israel, the nation. Because, frankly, you don't see what you think you see. You see a land that is more than happy to tell you what you want to hear. Donald Trump. Mr. Trump, President-elect of the United States of America, now too soon to become the actual President of the United States of America, not starting in 2017, but starting in January in 2017. He told people what they wanted to hear. He told a crowd, hey, I'm going to put up a wall and we're going to throw every Mexican out. And people wanted to hear that. And they yelled and screamed and said, yes, yes, we'll take Barabbas. We'll take Barabbas. Think about this while I'm saying this. We'll take Barabbas. Not Jesus. So Donald says, hey, I like that. They like me. They want to hear me. They think I'm important. Let me get on Twitter and talk about that. Being a wealthy man? Yeah, you know, ah. You know, I didn't stand a chance. Now it looks like I got a chance. So he says, uh, you know, America is pretty messed up. It's all about these people that, you know, shouldn't be here. You know, all these illegal aliens. We need to kick them out and throw them back to the country where they came from. We need to kick everyone out that doesn't belong here. White supremacists said, all right. 
We've heard this before. Your dad, you know, was one of us. So they jumped on the bandwagon. He told them what they wanted to hear. And the people were saying, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Forget the Jesus. So Donald says, hey, you know, this is working. If I tell these people this, the other people don't care because they get to hear what they want to hear. And then these other people are listening to what they want to hear. As a matter of fact, all these people are only hearing what they want to hear. Let me tell everyone what they want to hear. So if you listen to and look at during the campaign, all the time, no matter what came up, the man was telling each splinter group, which there's lots of splinter groups, everyone splinters off into some kind of group. You know, the born again Christians want to make him into, quite unquote, quote, quote unquote, a Christian. The, you know, uh, wealthy businessmen want to make him into a businessman. The, uh, people that are poor want to get some of his money. Um, whatever you wanted to hear, Donald Trump told you during the election. And, dare I say, you elected him. You did. I didn't vote, so I didn't elect him. <laughs> Sorry, didn't go that way. I prayed. God said, don't vote. I went, okay, no problem. I never have voted, so I don't have a problem with that. But you heard what you wanted to hear. You see, people can tell you the facts now, and it's interesting. This is why we know we're in the end times, part of it. You don't hear the facts about him, you know, well, you know, he's kind of screwed around with these women, you know, or, you know, he's been married quite a few times, you know, and did this, that, and the other thing, and, you know, this is kind of the bad news, but this is the good news. You don't hear that. You just hear what you want to hear. And so you only listen to that part, and you defend them, because you want what you want, because you want it. And that's true about, it wasn't, over 50% because not everyone voted for Donald Trump and most people did not vote so I'm not going to say everyone in America fell for it but the people that voted for him did and I've listened to every single person that has ever told me why they voted for Donald Trump and they only told me one little piece of what he said they ignored the rest they didn't care about the rest they only had one thing they wanted from him and I can tell you this, everything that he promised or he said that he was going to do, so far, he's already backtracked on and wheedled it down to where now it's not what he said he would do. It's what you're willing to compromise to accept from him. Let me put that into a different perspective. The scribes and the Pharisees grab Jesus and they say, ha, ah, we got him. Let's take him to Pontius Pilate. We can't kill him. They won't let us, but we need this man dead. Better that one man died and the whole nation perish. We know he blasphemed according to our law. So let's go tell Pontius Pilate. So they do. And in the meantime, they send out a letter to Rome because they were also, quote unquote, King Herod had religious and emotional and family ties back to Rome because he was a conniver. He was a crook. He had overseas connections, you know, like Donald and Putin. They met somewhere. They know each other. They talk. They visit. Hey, connections like Herod. So Herod knows this, and he says, okay, so here's how we got to do this. The scribes and the Pharisees and Herod and all of them get together, and they figure out a way to get Jesus crucified. So they stack the crowd. They promote the crowd. They bring in all of the supporters that are going to vote one way. And they put it in the crowd because they are going to push this upon Herod. And Herod tells and knows every step of the way what they're doing. Pontius Pilate knows Herod, so he knows this is all crooked. All of the scene that's going on has all been staged in order to promote and politicize some event that they're going to try to one-up on each other. They're attacking each other. Pontius Pilate wants to one-up on King Herod. King Herod's got it one step farther along than Pontius knows about. So here we go. We're set up now. We've got on the one hand Jesus, who really wasn't guilty, but he'd already been punished by being tortured in order to get a confession, and he didn't confess. So they still have to do something with him. They have to either, by Roman law, accept the fact that since he didn't confess, he can either be imprisoned, put in slavery, or released. Can't be killed. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't confess to it. There were no witnesses that agreed on it. So, he just was flawed for 
in this case, beaten with many stripes. We have a murderer that we know is guilty. On the one hand, you know, there's that, you know, whole shtick behind Roman law that says, if you kill the Roman, that means he dies. If you kill the citizen, that means he dies. No matter what, Roman law mandated that this man must die for us. So Pontius Pilate thinks he's going to pull a fast one. He says, ah, you know what? I'm going to do a quick You know, I know there's a habit we have here. And, and you know, you've seen the movies and you've seen the, the scene. You know, he watches his hands eventually about it, you know. But he says, I'm going to let the people decide. Well, as soon as Pontius says that or lets his cohorts, meaning maybe a centurion or maybe a guard or whatever, know that, quote, unquote, King Herod has a spy. He finds out. He stacks the deck. He pushes people into the crowd. Sure enough, when they go to the pavement and they decide to render a judgment, which is what the Romans do, they render judgment and they supposedly enforce the peace. Police officers, that's where we get it from, Pax Romanus. So they're going to enforce the law. They're going to promote the law. They're going to say, this is how we do it. We're going to pick one or the other to release them for mercy's sake. Playing God, we see a prophetic picture of what is going to happen. Will they choose this man who claims to be the son of God that will bring us a kingdom of peace? Or will they choose a murderer and a thief, a man of the people, of the people, by the people, and for the people, that believes in what the people believe in? They choose for us. Almost like when we voted, did we not choose a man of the people, for the people, by the people, and the people? Oh, we want him. Let his blood be upon our heads. Okay. Wash my hands of that matter. Prophetically, that's what happened to the nation of Israel. The blood of Jesus was upon them. Not in a good way that you think of it. The blood of Jesus. Let the blood of Jesus be on us. We're saved by the blood. I got news for you. Jesus' blood condemned the children of Israel. Condemned that generation. Condemned the Jews. They're gone. By 70 AD, wiped out most of the nation. Cast out from the land. Not all Jews were cast out. There's one or two left around, possibly. Just like previous times, you know. Kind of get thrown out and come back. Before they died off. And then, you know, perpetuated, had kids or whatever. But, you know, and then we call them, you know, mixed blood or whatever. If you want to call it that. And you want to get back to Ezra and Nehemiah. But the point of it is this. What did you see in those time periods if you were there? Did you see Jesus as being the one you would have chosen? Or did you see the reality of what's going on behind the scenes? You see, that's the problem with prophecy, is that we have a certain amount of seeing behind the scenes. If you're looking at prophecy, you know Israel is going to sell itself out. These are not people that are going, hey, thank you, America, we are going to stand with you for Jesus' sake. This is a nation that's saying, hey, Christian, you're going to get kicked out as soon as we get the land for ourselves. It is a Jewish nation, and that's not what the proclamation says. It says it would be a homeland for the Jew, and that the United Nations Charter allowed for those who were in the land at the time of the declaration to be in the land and have of the land. So the whole argument about the Palestinians not being Israeli is false. They are citizens. By proclamation of the United Nations, and by God. Yes, God. You see, you go back to Abraham and you start saying, well, you know, the children of Israel, they're giving this land unto the children of Abraham. What happened to Abraham's other children? Are some of them allowed in the land? Or one child of Abraham? Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, you know. Jacob and Esau. He'll be twelve and he'll be twelve. Children of Israel are the twelve and the children of Esau are twelve of the wild man. Jesus, even the dogs sit at the table waiting for scraps to fall. Yeah, but I'm just a lot of children. Lots. The nation today does not want Jesus. The nation of Israel today does not want Christians. The nation of Israel today wants to be completely as Benjamin Netanyahu has declared, free from any entanglements 
of America. We will be totally self-sufficient by the year 2000, I think he said, 13 originally. Then he postponed it to 15. Now it's who knows when. Supposedly, Israel as a nation has made so many contracts of selling nuclear weapons to India, oil and water and gas to now Cyprus and Greece and arms by way of selling it through third parties. Well, they don't even sell third party. I'm sorry, you can directly see it. Israel sells weapons and guns to anybody that will buy it. Literally, they take our weapons and they remake them and then they sell them because they make money up. And it's a good, it's a good thing. Uh, people in America want to, you know, chastise Monsanto, you know, as though they were some kind of like, a, oh, those guys are horrible, is evil. You know, they're taking, making genetic mutations of our wheat, of our barley of our you know, crops, and Monsanto bought it from Technion in Israel. Oh, well, we don't want stem cell research because, you know, taking stems out of babies is evil, you know, we don't want that. Stem cell research began at Technion in Israel. You know, a lot of what people don't want to hear is true about Israel because it's what they are. Israel doesn't have a moral compass. Israel doesn't have a reality check. Israel is going unchecked, and as long as people let them, they'll do anything they want to do, including sign with the Antichrist. Follow the false prophet. As long as we get what we want out of it, we'll do anything we want to do, because in the long run, we'll even break that contract. And that's what's going to happen in Israel. So today, when you look at Israel, I got a question for you. What do you see? Do you see someplace that God said, send me your money so I can grow trees? Do you see a nation that is in absolute rejection and obstinate pride against God? What do you see? Do you see a nation that's fulfilling their destiny by being in rebellion to God? Do you see that you're going to be blessed because you're enabling rebellion against the living God? Are you doing what Jesus said to his people? Go to my people Israel and say unto them, Hear me. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Go ye into all the nations, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. What are you doing? What do you see? How are you living? Now, frankly, I'm Jewish. You know, I'm a boy a Christian, don't get me wrong. I'm pretty much radical Jesus freak. So people call me a Jesus gypsy because I've been around a lot of places. You know, I went to Alaska, I went to Mexico, I went to Israel, you know, I've been to Oregon. There's a lot of states of the Union. But I'm also Jewish in one way. As far as I'm concerned, I don't give a damn. You know, I, I really don't care what you think about Israel. You think you're being blessed because you bless them, and I'm telling you, you're bringing the curses upon us because you're blessing them. It's not blessing the nation Israel, God said. He said, bless the children of Abraham. Who are the children of Abraham? By faith, literally, according to Hebrews, and Paul, and anyone else who follows God, instead of following man, it's not the nation Israel. It would be a people that are seeking after the Lord their God. And I don't mean replacement theology, I mean Jewish people that are humble, that are weak, that are in Israel, that don't believe in what Bibi is saying, that you do, don't. You think that the nation of Israel somehow is wrapped up, packaged up, and put into a nice little box that we call Bibi. Benjamin Netanyahu, oh, I love that man, he knows what's right. Well, let me tell my people to... Study the Bible. We're going to have Bible studies. Folks, that's not what he said. It's what he did is the reality. The Bible study was the Orthodox having studies on the first five books of the Torah that make sure that no one in Bibi's government becomes a Christian. Bibi is not a Christian. He is supported by the Orthodox party and other parties that know what they want, what they get, and what he gives them, because if they don't, they will dissolve the government, and he will not be the prime minister. They have a different kind of what we call democracy, 
representation government there that if the certain parties don't get what they want, they just have a vote of no confidence, they get to have a new election. And then the majority elects whether or not the president, prime minister, can be in office, and then he has to form a government by all these different special interest groups getting what they want. The Orthodox control who is a citizen right now. The Supreme Court, yeah, they get to kind of overrule them at times, but guess what? The policy of the nation of Israel right now is to kick out everyone that's not Jewish and you're considered not Jewish because you're a Christian. Every Jew that believes in Messiah as being the Jewish Messiah is considered not Jewish by Bibi's government and thrown out if they can. They can't get out anymore because the Supreme Court said, no, wrong. People have fought for this. And so the Supreme Court is allowed so far. Now, will they create a law? That's what they're trying to do. When you tell me that, you know, you're going to support the settlements. You're talking about somebody that has gone ahead with a plan that was proposed back in 1960s in order to get Jerusalem to be the capital of Israel to build settlements around the entire outside of the perimeter of Jerusalem itself so that no way could anyone get inside. Because when you build literally a housing complex, you build it out of stone and cement. It's like a wall. And it's building a wall around Jerusalem. And the settlements that we're talking about aren't land that was part of the nation of Israel. It isn't something that was taken in the 1967 war. This is where literally there are people living right now. People already in a house and a home that are going to be torn down, wiped out, leveled, and then built high rise apartments. And just because they're Arab Israeli, you're going to tell me you support that? Because you have them kicked out, treated as not a citizen when they already are a citizen. That's the same way and the equivalent of in America telling a Navajo he's not an American citizen and he has no right to the Navajo nation that was given to him on the reservation. And you're going to go in and you're going to level out his house, his home, and his people and throw them out and send them to Mexico or wherever, Canada. Probably Canada because they allow natives there. And tell them that it's our right, manifest destiny, which is what we've used all along, by God to make America for white Americans, not Navajo. Not use. Not Amerindians. Not any native. Same thing. Exactly the same thing that's going on in Israel right now on the land grab with the settlements. So, Suddenly, you know, somebody yells and screams and says, oh, you know, President Obama sold out Israel. No, they didn't. What sold out Israel is Mr. Netanyahu acting on his own accord for special interest to take some land that wasn't part of the nation of Israel, that wasn't the Israeli nation that was given by the United Nations, that isn't going to be honored by God because that's not how you do it. Abraham, when he went to go get a cave for Sarah, they wanted to give it to him. He said, no, I'll buy it. No, I'll buy it. I'll buy it so it's mine. My title is not because you're giving it to me. The nation of Israel has been bought. What Bibi is doing is taking land without ever reciprocating to those people that are living there to give them money for their house, their home, and their livelihood that they've been there since the nation was started and they've lived as citizens honoring it. And I'm not talking about West Bank or some other Gaza script that you talk about when you say Palestinian. I'm talking about Jerusalem. I'm talking about the settlements. We're not talking about the same thing because I want to know you as a Christian, what are you looking at when you go to Israel? Do you know the facts or are you just like in the election, seeing what you want to see, hearing what you want to hear, and voting in a tyrant? You see, that's prophecy. According to the letter of the word of God, what's happening in these latter days is delusion, illusion, and confusion. Delusion is simply looking at something and saying, that's not snow out there, and it's snowing all outside, you know. That's not snow, that's white covering that isn't real but is a 
vapor that's been released by seeding the clouds. That is one of those cloud seeding plot conspiracies that the government has done to confuse you, to make you think it's snow and it's really polluting you and it's causing you to get sick. Conspiracy theory. Vapor trails. Myths. Myths. A lot of what people believe about Israel is mythology. You know, they'll say, well, you know, God gave this and this is the land that they're going to get. You know, and this is what God... But what did he say in the meantime? See, there's a key issue here. What you say may not be wrong, but it may not be right. You may not be wrong about there being seeding in the clouds. Sometimes clouds get seeded by lots of things. Pollution, you know, may cause things. Like right now we have a poor air quality day because the clouds are there. The pollution goes up, hits the clouds, gets involved in it, you know, and kind of like stays there. And then kind of it does rain or you get acid rain from the same idea, but does it, you know, kind of seeded. But does that mean that it's a government plot? No. But did you know that there are people that are promoting the rare earth or the flat earth theory? Did you know that there are people in America that are promoting cloud uh, seeding by vapor trails? If there are people that are running around, like you would say, putting on these hats, you know, that are half foil because they want to be protected from the microwaves, the electronic waves, now the EMP waves, the cell phone waves, the cosmic. Recently, the latest one was that today, while I'm recording this, supposedly I'm being affected by this cosmic discharge wave that came out of the sun, and I was going to hit here on December 27th, and now I'm a part of that. Not solar discharge. We're not talking about that. We're talking about somebody who just has this weird theory of some kind of made-up science that isn't true, but is crackpot that isn't any way, shape, or form dem demonstratively provable, but because he's got a website, and because he's got a following, he can put it out there, and he can keep creating false science that people believe in. Conspiracy theories is not something that is once false, and is still false. Conspiracy theories now become what people think is facts they believe in, and they will live by it and die by it. For us. A syndrome of the people, by the people, for the people, of the people. You see, that's kind of what happened in Israel. At one time, there were a people that came from Russia. It started back when Israel became a nation. No, not 1940s. 1800s. When Israel, according to Jewish thought, became a nation. You see... Americans like to say, well, you know, we don't go by the United Nations when they became a nation. Well, then how did you pick 1948? I mean, if you're not going to go by one part of what the United Nations declared, then how are you going by telling people that they can't live there that are given that land also by the United Nations? Oh, well, you know, God gave them the land, so we ignore the United Nations. When did God give it to them? In 1948? In other words, your logic doesn't make any sense, and you don't make any sense because you're sounding stupid. Because what you've done is that you've taken this one thing, Israel the way I want it to be, and said, I'm going to make God do what I want it to be, and I'm going to make God go through what I want it to be. Instead of saying, thy will be done. As a matter of fact, what would Jesus say today if he didn't do the same thing that he did on his way outside of Jerusalem? Do you think today, looking at Jerusalem, he's going to say, hey, I'm coming, great Blessed are you, you know, and let's just send you some money and I'll send you a blessing and here, I'm blessing you Israel, you know. Or would he say, woe unto you, Israel. Woe unto you women of Jerusalem who give suck because how bad it is for you now that you have children and you have to flee Jerusalem because sudden destruction has come upon you by your own actions. Woe unto you men who say this is right and that is wrong. Because sudden destruction has come upon you. Do you see all these marvelous settlements that are being made? I tell you the truth, they will be destroyed and devastated. For if they've done this to me in a good season, then how much worse would it be if they did it in a bad season? And this was good during the time that Jesus was there. Now we see it at the end of the world, and it's bad and getting worse. Do you think that, oh, well, you know, <laughs> 
Yeah, it's going to be okay, you know, they're going to live through it. All of them? How many died when Jesus was born? Now, how many do you think he's going to die or Jews are going to die before Jesus comes again? We see a woman pregnant that's going to go out into the wilderness and preserve those who are going to, and they're going to all hide out in the rock city of Petra, and they're going to be safe from, you know, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, you know, annihilation by the Antichrist, Ten Nation Confederacy, false prophets, and all these other people. They'll be spared because, you know, suddenly it'll be perfect. You know, when it, Russia attacks, you know, the Third Army disappears, it'll be an anchor, it'll be, you know, and think of us all Mongo. You know, because Israel's been so faithful, now during the Great Tribulation, oh, now I'm going to save them all. Do you see that in the Old Testament? Do you see that in the New Testament? Jesus already came and yet the nation is still wiped out. You see the church not getting out of Jerusalem like Jesus said, go out, not go in. And they have to be thrown out by the devastation that comes upon the temple being destroyed. We saw what happened about that. Instead of the church being located centrally in Jerusalem, all of a sudden now it's over in Rome. Byzantium. Constantinople, Alexandria, kind of keep moving, Germany, France, Italy, America, Jerusalem. When I lived in Israel, I didn't love it. I didn't. I lived in downtown Old city, Jerusalem, on top of the Mediterranean Hotel called the Petra Hospital. And I slept on the roof. I built a tent. I was up on the roof. I loved it. I looked down. I could see over the rooftops of all of Jerusalem. Old and new. Well, new was kind of like being built over here, you know, kind of up on the ridges. But, you know, you could see all the hills of Jerusalem. You could see the Dome of the Rock right over, let's see, I'll wake up and look at right over here. Yeah, no, no, it's right about here. Yeah, right about here. Over here was kind of like the Basilica of something, you know, and they had that there, you know, whatever it was. Building square, kind of, over there. Um, behind me was, I forget, which was going up the hill, was going up and out, you know, maybe could have been King David Hotel, I don't remember. Um, but I'm facing the east, you know, so I'm looking over and now attention or whatever. Um, behind Jerusalem, out, you know, and out east, you know, looking towards the east. That's how I slept. I don't know, about three months, you know, I lived up on the rooftop of the Mediterranean Hospital, the Mediterranean Hotel, the Petra Hospital, and it was, for me, interesting, because it was so much going on of Catholic, Protestants, uh, Evangelicals, Wackos, Weirdos, Jews, Armenians, you know, whatever religious group you want to talk about, they all meet in Jerusalem. There used to be what they call a Jerusalem syndrome. It still goes on. When people go to Jerusalem, they get a little wacko because there's so much things going on on the city that literally, I say, it's oppressed. There's a principality over it. You know, covering. Uh, it's not God, but there's a principality over it. You know, it's kind of like people get weird. You know, they get off and they go on tangents. You know, and Calvary chapels several times, you know, were started and failed there. You know, and dare I say, you know, there's some that have succeeded now in different ways, in different manners, and whatever you call success. Um, other churches, you know, I've been there a long time. Catholic churches, you know, Armenian churches, you know, and they've kept things going with the relics and all that kind of stuff from the Constantine days and from the, you know, life of Constantine, pointing out different places that, yeah, that's where Jesus was born, that's where he died, that's where he lived, that's where this is, that, but because she wanted it to be. Notice the historical accuracy. She wanted it to be there, so she picked it. And so today, people are saying, oh, I found this relic underneath here, so this is where it was. Usually the Dome of the Ra, or usually the place where Jesus was crucified, is looked at as the bus station, where there's kind of like on the rock cliff, you know, this skull, which is called Golgotha, which is kind of like, makes perfect sense. It looks like it, it has to change much in the formation of the rock over all those years and hundreds of years. So, probably was there. But now there's a bus station, so they don't want it there, they want it somewhere else, so that they can charge admission. You know, kind of like what happened with the garden tomb. You go in and you pay admission. You, know. you can watch, you know, in Bible land in America, you know, the flood three times a day. You know, no one the flood. But it's an admission, a price to pay. Something to 
you know, take your kids so they can get a piece of the bike. No. I didn't get wide eyed and, you know, amazed by Jerusalem. Or Israel. I lived with Jews, served Jews, was learning my Hebrew, studied with um, some Jews. Underneath it all, undercover, I was one of the messianic or one of the Jewish Christians, you know, you can call it messianic if you want to, we don't really think it that way, but you know, I attended, you know, one of the ones that are now famous, you know, one for Israel, I think of them wherever. But anyway, um, one of the famous churches in uh, Jewish assemblies in um, Jerusalem, I can't even think of the name of it now, um, right next to the Reform Synagogue, Reform gave it to him, you know, so they just um, The only Reform Synagogue at one time, that was in Jerusalem. Um, I witnessed, I evangelized. Three of us went to places where other, if you got caught, you would have been either dead, mysteriously, or you would have been exported out of Israel if you, you know, were wealthy or you were well known, because then they would just kick you out of the country and keep you out. We never got caught. We risked a lot of things in a lot of people's lives by being involved in it, but we witnessed. We passed out tracts that were published in Israel. Um, we went into Meir Sharim on Shabbat, you know, because that was the only time that they wouldn't be out, but we would go out, you know, and put tracks in their door boxes, you know. We did a lot of things that were, you know, dangerous in Jerusalem. It would have been easier to do it in, uh, uh, can't even think of the name of the city on the coast now. But in some parts of Israel, they're very open to gay community. Jerusalem, you probably get killed, but, you know, gay community, they're open to homosexuality, they're open to uh, humanism, they're open to Buddhism, they're open to Zen, they're open to Taoism, they're open to everything else except Christianity. They let it happen. Don't get me wrong. They let it happen, but they keep it suppressed. A Jew that converts will get you in prison. A Jew that you witness to, it's okay, because, you know, they didn't convert. Go to the Supreme Court and say that you didn't convert, then that person gets out of prison. But in the meantime, you paid a lot of money, you got oppressed, you got suppressed. I remember in the bed that I slept in, when the Orthodox found out where I was at, they threw a stone in, and I wasn't there at the time, but the stone was a pretty good sized stone. I mean, that kind of probably would have killed me in my sleep. There in my bed. How do you see it? Do you see it as some golden tourist spot? Do you see it as a great place to take our Bible scholars and our students and let's go up and give a Bible study on the actual site and look out over the land? I was let down. You think that's a mountain? Man, you ain't been to Alaska. <laughs> so, my idea of Israel is kind of a little different because I live in, with, and about the people. I got my eggs from the Arab port. I got my vegetables and fruit from the Jewish quarter. I got my food stuffs mostly, not from a grocery store. So once in a while I bought some canned goods from a grocery store. Don't eat canned, eat everything fresh, mostly. There may be more stores now, but back then there wasn't. We didn't buy meat. You know, the meat was food. But you did go out and eat shawarma and get meat off the spits, you know, that were cooking, especially in the airport, because they had pork and they had other things that you could eat. You know. So, how do you see Israel? Because, you see, as bad as persecution of Jews were, and how lying about what Jews do was common here in America for a long time. Oh, those Jews will steal your children. The same thing is true today about Israel and politics. Israel and politics. You see, we're supposed to look at the children of Israel coming back into the land. Okay, cool. But then, the children of Israel coming back into the land, when they went into the land the first time, they did not take all the land they were supposed to take. God says, hey, look, Ephraim, you didn't get everything you were supposed to get. Why not? I told you to go conquer. And you didn't. Well, I don't know. 
Do you think Ephraim is wonderful? Do you think Judah is marvelous? Do you think that Israel is any different than America? There are places in America that I like to go visit and I like to go spend quality time with God. When I go to Jerusalem, I met so many people where I live. I bring them up to the rooftop so they can look over the, you know, vista of all of Jerusalem. You know, I may, I wouldn't show them my tent, you know, I'd pull my tent down or pick it, put it back up, whatever. You know, because it was like no big deal. I mean, I had a picture of my tent. It was funny because I had, a, I had my tent up and then I had snow covered. You know, eventually later on, I got a job living with a man, uh, not Ben Etzioni, and I was with Metapel. You know, I was with, uh, uh, what do we call it here? Um, not manservant, but I was his um, adult foster care person. You know, I paid good money to take care of him, you know, keep him, take care of him. He's fine. He's 89 years old. He's a war hero. Uh, he was one of those that freed the children of the Nazi camp, you know, so he was for the children, and he helped smuggle them into Israel. Because it was illegal at the time. He was also a war hero because he worked for, he was rewarded with um, certain honors for being a uh, Italian army, American army, Nazi army, or German army, uh, Arab army, Israeli Palmach army. An Egyptian army. He was a quadruple, duple, whatever spot, because he was a piano troop. And every one of these armies kept hiring him and using him and incorporating him in their army to tune pianos. And he passed secrets all over the place, you know, misinformation to everybody except Israel. And he was really working for Israel all along. Fascinating man. Dr. Hetzel, you know, war hero. You don't hear about those things. Some things are kept back in Israel. So, I worked for him. I lived with him. And I loved the man. He was so gentle. He was a reformed Jew. We went to a reformed temple. We went to temple, you know, a uh, reformed synagogue. Went to temple, you know, and uh, every Shabbat, you know, and he had this other woman that he was always flirting with. She, he was 90, 89, and she was 91. And she was all dolled up and he was all decked out, you know, and they just were so cute. They always sat in the front because they were the eldest, you know, and Reform always honored them every time that they were there because they're still alive. You know, you'd see them coming in and I'd just be sitting there like, life in Israel. Not what you see, what I see. We've been talking about that a lot because I know it's not hard for me to combine, to define or define what you see because it's all tourists. It's all, you know, what you want to see. It's all about, you know, prophecy of something that you created, you know, that you say more about than what is true. And I wanted to define for you a little bit, just by that story, of what Israel is, you know. But I want to tell you what Israel is becoming, you know, it's going to become. It's going to become a nation that is running for its life. It's not going to be, you know, pro-American, because do you remember, let's be clear, you remember an Israeli war with you know Egypt and America was involved and we sank or Israel sank an American uh, spy boat, you know, or battleship? Yeah, we did. Okay. We I should quit saying we now that I thought about not trying to think of we as me and you, but Israel wiped out an American boat. Sank it. To this day, you know, nothing much was done about it. One of those things that went, oops, you know, did, did, did American spy boat travel into waters where it might, where it should not be? According to America, no. According to Israel, yes. Uh, did Israel not want America to see what they were doing in the Suez Canal? Heck yeah, they wiped it out. So, you know, everything you hear about history isn't always completely what you remember about history because sometimes you didn't want to know about all the rest of history, what was done or not done. It's kind of like when we talk about Vietnam, you know, we say, what about the My Lai Massacre? Well, we don't talk about that. 
Well, what about the prison on Karib? You know, where our American soldiers tortured and made fun of, um, you know, Muslim detainees. We don't want to talk about that. That was a rare, you know, exception to the rule. Vietnam and the prison? Exception to the rule. And now we've got what? Americans saying Muslims are going to do what? They hate Muslims? They are angry against Muslims? So now we carry that over to Israel. We say, oh, well, we hate Arabs. We hate Palestinians. We don't want them to have any property value, any rights to their own house, to their own job, to their own people, even though they're living in peace, in a bit of peace all this time, and they are doing jobs that Israelis will not do, which I know because I've been there and I've seen it, just like here in America, where we won't, we won't go out and pick the harvest. We want Mexicans to do it, or anyone else that will do it. But, oh no, gotta make them citizens first, but then we don't want to pay them citizens wages. So make them green card workers. Israel does the same thing. South Africans are by thousands. They hire people from overseas to come and live there, to work, to pay them less than Israeli wages. But do we see it that way? Or do we just, well, that's something we don't want to see. Donald Trump, his own employee. I didn't see that coming. Why not? Well, because I was against those, not me. Talking about them people, not me doing it. You guys do it. Israel itself isn't operating on a way that you think. A Jew is for a Jew and for a Jew only. Some of what people accuse Zionism of is true. Zionism really is about Zion. Not it's about God. And not about fulfilling destiny. We'll tell you that. Hey, you know, who's coming in next? Christian? Okay, well, give them the Christian message. Who's coming in next? Right? Ah, give them the hardcore message. Who's coming in next? Oh, we'll tell them this. TV lied constantly to the United Nations telling them how fast Iran was going to get the bomb, and it still hasn't happened. TV had us blowing Iran up back before President Obama even got elected. Then after President Obama got elected the first time over eight years ago. Iran is going to bomb us. We have to do something now. If you don't, we will. And it happened every year until this year when the settlement was more important than actually bombing Iran. If we go by a prophet, then Prime Minister Netanyahu is a false prophet because seven years ago, six years ago would have been the date that it was too late to stop Iran from having nuclear weapons and he promised that he was going to bomb Iran by then. He never was going to, and he never was, and everybody knew it, but he kept saying that to the American people. All the experts knew better, because it would start a war that Israel can't win. And Israel doesn't want to do that at all, much less start World War III. And it's not just about Iran and Israel, there'd be a whole lot more involved. And I don't mean because they're Muslims. I mean because... Once you start bombing one country, accidents happen, and other people who want to make it an opportunity for themselves use it. And there I say, Israel has enemies around that aren't all the nations around. Jordan's fine. I mean, there are countries that get along with Israel and make treaties and have all kinds of agreements, including Egypt. Oh, you forgot. It's not about all Muslims hating Israel, is it? Because after all, isn't Egypt guarding Israel's southern border? And doesn't Israel tell Egypt what to do about their southern border? Ooh, I forgot about that. Remember when they were tunneling and Egypt had to go in and you know, wipe out all those Muslims? Yeah. Supporting Israel. Yeah. Oops. What I'm saying to you is in your viewfinder, as you take binoculars and you focus in, you only see this little tiny speck out there, and you don't see all the rest. Israel is the same way. If you're looking at Israel as one promise that bless me and I will bless you, you are being lied to. That's not how it works. There's more to the scripture that applies. We'll get into that in the um, coming days during the 2017 when it's appropriate for that to be about one prophecy and one scripture, but because tonight is about overview, we don't want to focus in only on one, even though it's about Israel, supposedly about Israel, but it's really about 
the children of Abraham, you know, and Isaac and Jacob. I mean, do you think that if you bless me by, you know, sending me money, you're going to get blessed? Okay, then send me a thousand dollars. You get a thousand blessings. Oh, send me a thousand. I'm a Jew. Send me a thousand dollars because I'll be blessed out of your mind. But if, you know, if you attack me, guess what? I'm a Jew. You're going to die. Is that what you're saying? Are you sure? Because you see, there are people that I deal like I said that pastor. I dealt with. He literally believes that. And he's a Calvary Chapel pastor. And he's been taught that, believes that, and is teaching that. It's false. A sinner is a sinner whether they're Jewish or not. The nation of Israel is in sin and so it needs to repent. You don't tell someone, oh, God bless you and keep sinning. Israel is not doing good. They're failing miserably. They're going the way of the world. They're used by Satan right now. And sooner or later, it's going to backfire. Then they're going to be running for their lives, crying out to the nation, help! I mean, it was funny when you think about how small Israel is. I mean, I can drive almost the entire state of Israel going down to one end of Utah and back. Not a 12 hour drive. That's about all there is to Jerusalem. I mean, to Israel. It's not that big. It's real small. But it seems like it's big because everybody gets so inflated ideas about what's going on or what's happening. It's like BB can say, oh, we had a terrorist attack. You know, a guy on a knife on the bus, you know, killed three people. Or was he a criminal? Yeah, he was part of the, you know, mob that hangs out down in the Sinai desert, you know. And, you know, he was um, connected with, you know, the other mob that's there in Jerusalem. And um, he had connections with, um, you know, this other, you know, mob that's in, um, you know, uh, just outside of Jerusalem, but I can't think of the name of the city right now. But anyways, um, so, what, you know, was he, a, was he a mobster or was he a gang member? Yeah, he's a gang member. Oh, but was he serious? Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Which, are you American? Are you, like, you know, Israeli? In Israel, yeah, the story went out that he was part of the gang. You know, the gang warfare that's going on in Israel. Did you know this gang warfare going on? But uh, overseas, ah, oh, he's a terrorist, man. Ah, oh, yeah, another terrorist. Radical extremist. Of what? Was he Muslim? No, he was Muslim. A radical extremist. You see, not all that's news is news. We've discovered in this last election, hoax news. Russia helped promote that. Some of the campaign managers have known about, you know, propaganda and disinformation. No one does disinformation as good as Israel because Israel has, frankly, one of the big news services as a government office releasing disinformation to keep everybody off guard so they don't know what's true on purpose. Disinformation has been going on since well, before Israel became a nation, literally. There was a part of the Palmach that actually started disinformation and was putting out publications in Arab, in, yeah, in Arab tongues um, that was about you know false statements so that it would mislead them into going to the wrong place at the wrong time so that Israel could do something else somewhere else. Um, or the Palmach could run an operation. So disinformation works. It's always worked. And, uh, Everybody learned it from Hitler because Hitler just simply repeated the same thing over again, you know, and people began to believe it. It's kind of like what uh, Donald Trump started doing, you know, and found out that he could say it, and the more he said it, the more people were believing it. And even more, which was scary, if you do it at the right time. So is that to say, so we understand each other? I'll take my hat off. Is that to say, don't love Israel? No, but it doesn't mean you love them more or less. Do you get it? Does that to say to us that Israel isn't chosen by God for a particular time piece? You know, the, the birth of Israel. We talked about the birth of Israel to begin with, and then we skipped over it. But literally, back in the 1800s, when Theodore Herzl stood up and said, "Today we have a nation." For Jews, for us, for Russian Jews who started the nation, who were at the World Zionist Congress in 1893, I believe, or maybe it was uh, The World Zionist Congress, finally, after a couple of 
trying to get all the Jews in Europe together to meet Peter Herschel, the father of Israel. Funny, you didn't hear him call that, did you? Except for Jews. He sat down and he said, we today have a nation, and that was 120 years to the day that Jerusalem became the capital of Israel. 120 years before 1967, you will find a Jew standing up and saying, today Israel is born. And he proposed the Israeli flag that we have today. He proposed the national anthem that we have today. He proposed the way of governments that we have today. As a matter of fact, just about everything in Israel today is based upon that same statement, that same direction, that same declaration of the World Zionist Congress that proposed and stated that we are a nation at the turn of the century. Interesting, at the turn of the century, we have on the one hand, Israel becoming a nation declared by a Jew and Jews in Europe. And on the other hand, we have the Pentecostal evangelical movement starting with, oh, boom, explosion of the Holy Spirit. Simultaneously. Both starting. In the church, we have suddenly the Holy Spirit as an emphasis. The direction. The latter reign. We have people like Ellen G. White that are going to come up. We have Pentecostal going to come up. Clarence Larkin beginning his chart. We have all these things suddenly a focus in on Israel becoming a nation. And at the same time, over in Europe, guess what? Neither one connected to each other. The Holy Spirit raises up a man and he says, Today we have a nation. Oy. And from that day on, they sent Russians to Israel, scientists, botanists, wealthy people, as missionaries to start a nation. They went into Israel during the 1800s and 19, early 1900s, before World War I, buying land from the Muftis that the Muftis were more than happy to sell. Hey, you want to buy that 12 land? Sure, we'll sell it to you. And they sold it to them. So they would start a kibbutzim. And because they were Russian scientists, they knew how to drain the land. They planted types of trees that come out of Australia, believe it or not. And it drains the water. And they planted knowing that in 40 years, 50 years, that 12 land will become prime farmland. Because it's going to drain the land. And today you still find those trees. Amazing planning for the future. All these Russian immigrants, all these people from Europe, Romanians, Lithuanians, Estonians, countries that no longer exist, coming that were Jewish, that had Jews in them that were coming to Israel because they believed that today we have a nation, now let's go get it. They bought the land. They didn't need the United Nations to declare that Israel today is a nation. 1948. Since when? Israel was fighting to be a nation since World War I, World War II, and finally in guilt after that, the United Nations makes Israel a nation? I got news for you. We Jews know when Israel became a nation. That was not in 1948, which is why your prophecy is so screwed up. Now, if your prophecy is about the United Nations, when was that date that declared Israel a nation? Oh, okay, I can agree with you. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's true. You know, we had this World Council, you know, and they became, uh, after the World Council of Nations, they became the United Nations. When they became the United Nations, uh, they got together and, you know, everybody petitioned and they said, okay, we feel bad, so let's go ahead and give them a nation. Not according to prophecy. Not according to God. Not according to what the will of God was being done in one man. Maybe not one, because the World Council, you know, World Congress of Zionists, it wasn't one man, but he was the leader of it. He was the president of it. He was the one who stood up and said it. When the decree went forth from, from, <laughs> as the decree went forth, went down to 260 days, drew to Jerusalem, Jesus riding into Jerusalem. What happened? Jesus comes in. Your king has arrived. Welcome. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. How many days before that did it? The decree went forth to rebuild Jerusalem. When did the decree go forth to rebuild Jerusalem in the modern times? 120 years to the year of Jerusalem becoming one city as the capital of Israel forever. 1967. 120 years before that. Ah, oh, we have a nation. 
The decree went forth. Let's go build a nation. Let's go buy the land. Let's go take back the land. Where do you hear that before? Where do you know in scripture that is true? Nehemiah. To go from Babylon. To go forth back to Jerusalem. To build the wall as Ezra and Nehemiah the book is written of. Do you see a parallelism? Do you see something similar between one and the other? Do you see a Jew in the time of Ezra, the time of Nehemiah, the time of building that temple, going forth with the decree, with the positive stamp seal of approval of the nation, the world leader, to go and build your walled city. But come back to And yet, we hear of a man, how many years later, how many centuries later, doing the same thing? Exactly. How did Nehemiah build the wall? How did Nehemiah build the temple? How did Zerubbabel's temple get built? How did it become Herod's temple? How come we have now in the land a certain amount of a false temple and a real temple that's going to be built? And yet we still have an Antichrist to come who says he's going to cause the oblation to cease. The prayer is to cease. Then say he'll stop the temple sacrifices. Does it or does it? You see, there's a lot more to the Old Testament than meets the eye. There's a lot more about the Bible that fits. As a matter of fact, the reality of what Israel is, is a living example of what's going on today. It's what's always gone on in the Old Testament. What's going on even now in fulfilling the Old Testament to become the New Testament. To become the reality of Jesus is coming now just like he did the first time. There is no difference. You tell me what's the sign of his coming and I'll tell you it's a star. And it's going to be seen over Bethlehem. You'll see it there, and you'll see it here, and you'll see it up there, and you'll see it as you are looking for it. Because if you were looking in the sky towards the east, you would see a star tonight. In the early morning, you'd see a morning star. In the early evening, you'd see the evening star. And it is brighter than any other star that you've seen out tonight. Go out tonight. Look for it. You will see it. The sign of it coming. Jesus is coming. Sooner than you think. He's not only around the corner, he's knocking at your door. God has been calling out, hey, pay attention. I've given you all these things for your improvement, for your learning, for your teaching, for your understanding, for your prophetic fulfillment. You don't have to make up a new prophecy and claim it's the body. My God, how blasphemous is it to take something from Islam throw it inside the Bible and claim it from there. That's not how it worked. That's the Antichrist. As a matter of fact, the book of Muhammad, that, or the book that Muhammad used in order to write the Quran is the Bible. He took things out of the Bible to create a Arabic version of a Bible that would unify the tribes from warring against each other under one world religion. Now, he didn't call it a world religion. He called it an Arabic Arabic, Arabic religion, one that would bring peace to his people. He took the pattern of Moses and used it. Funny, how that works. We see Joseph Smith trying the same thing. Didn't work. We see lots of cults doing the same thing. Doesn't work. As a matter of fact, if you understand that Israel is repeating itself and repeating history, then you know you can look around and see the repetition of history happening over and over and over and over again. Even after the beginning of World War One, before it happened. What nations were aligned? Now look around. When you look at the beginning of World War Two, which set up by World War One, you know, the German stomp down, set down, of no longer being a world power, to being so broken, so poor, they could never rise again. Rising to a world power. What do we see today? German Chancellor Helmut, what is she doing and how big is she in the economic European community? How big is the economic European community when it comes to bucks compared to America? How much avenue of inventions and peoples and resources do they have that we do not have? Are we, in fact, a part of that? Or are we just like we said in hour one? 
we are like Israel as a shadow of things to come. Look at the world and then look at America. What's happening in America happens outside in the world. You will see a direct parallel. If you want to find Israel, look around. You can find things that are happening in America happening inside of Israel. If you look inside of Israel at the people, you will see it happening in the world. It's amazing the parallels. We are not one of the tribes of the children of Israel. We are not the chosen people. We are a chosen people. Not the chosen people. A chosen people. A chosen generation. We are seeing the fulfillment of all things because guess what? God shed his grace upon us to be as likened unto Israel. Not Israel. We're not replacement. But a lot of people got the idea of replacing Israel because of that. Because it's so similar. But it's not the same. Israel's democracy is nowhere near anything like we have in America. And America has nothing like we have anywhere else in the world. But the whole world is patterned like it. We are causing influences that in the world are the same way that the Antichrist will do. We are a type of the Antichrist. We are a type of the beast. And we're a type of Israel. All at the same time in America. That's why America isn't in prophecy. It's a type or a shadow of all the prophecy. Jesus has been blessing us because he gave us, just like in Israel, when that man stood up in Europe and then sent people to go to Israel to start a nation, we started in the Jesus movement to go out and start a revival that never ended. And it still hasn't, no matter what some of the Jesus freaks have become. Pardon me, they become yuppies and then they got kids and they decided Jesus was coming. So we're just going to kick back and relax. And now we're going to have reminiscent parties. Excuse me? Wake up, thou sleeper. Rise from the dead. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's the fact, Jack. We are standing at the cusp of the fulfillment of all things, and people have gone to sleep and laid back and said, Ah, so, where's the sign of his coming? Well, he's not coming through Europe. We need to make something up and say he's coming through Saudi Arabia? Iraq? Iran? I think he already said he was coming from where he's coming from. No, 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 no. You don't get it. That was a mistake. He made a mistake, but since 9-11, we figured it out. Because after all, the body idea of prophecy being fulfilled for, in America, prophecy scholars, was not promoted before 9-11. It's a false teaching, a false idea. You want to know where the Antichrist comes from? He comes from Israel. Come on now. The Messiah comes from Israel. The Antichrist comes from Israel. Messiah, anti-Messiah. Religion, anti-religion. Temple, anti-temple. God, anti-God. It's all there in Israel. Yes, he will be of Jewish descent, so though he might not be born in Israel, he might not have been raised in Israel, but he's got Jewish lineage. Just like Jesus was born of a virgin, but his father was not Joseph. I got news for you. The Antichrist can't do born of a virgin because he's not God, and Satan is not God, it's just an angel. And it's not going to be an angel impregnating a woman and suddenly the Antichrist becomes like, you know, the son of God. No, but he will have as it were, a questionable lineage. But it will be Jewish, partially. He will do things in the political arena. He will come out of Europe just as it said he would. Even as, guess what? Where was Jesus called from? Egypt, a type of the world. You stretch out your hands and you can go from Egypt all the way to Europe. No problem. We are seeing a symbolism, a uniformity, a continuity of simile, of metaphor, of history, and the repetition of what we call cyclical fulfillments. That means that every cycle, all the way full circle, you see a whole gamut of prophecies being added again. Everything coming together to almost the full, complete peak. Back in the 1800s, they thought it was then. Why? Because they had a lot of the pieces fit, but there were still a few that didn't. They weren't in the land yet. So in the 1800s, they said, the next thing that's going to happen on the prophetic calendar is the nation of Israel will be born. In 1800s, at the turn of the century, in 1870, 
they started saying, it's going to happen soon. And guess what happened? A Jew stands up in Europe and says, we have a nation. And he calls it Israel. Do you want to follow Israel into apostasy? Do you want to follow America into backsliding or the ghetto? Do you want to follow Europe into a place where even the Europeans don't want? Brexit is all about the idea, we don't want that. We see what's coming. That's not what we signed up for. We were going to unify but not that way. Now they don't want to. How long will it take? How long do you have left? When will the fulfillment of Brexit be accomplished? That should give you a real big warning sign. Warning, warning. If it's going to take three years, hey, guess what? Before three years are up and the three horns that were the one horn that kind of get worry in and then go out and then cause all kinds of things to happen, that's going to be during the Great Tribulation. Holy crap, that means the revelation of the rapture is happening right now. When are we going to see it? Brexit's a big, giant warning, warning. David, warning, like the robot did, warning, warning. Run, run, run. The cry has gone out. Brexit, Israel, America. I have no better way of saying if there's a type of what is failing and the end of the world than my God, the candidacy, I'm not going to say the man, the candidacy of Donald Trump proves we're in the last days. The candidacy of an American president, though not in prophecy, reveals all the signs of prophecy. Every single warning of what the age would see of those that would be in rebellion of God was demonstrated in the candidacy of an American president who is now sitting and getting ready to move into a White House that is going to not be what you think it's going to be. The same way that you're going to look at Benjamin Netanyahu as a hero, and he's more than likely going to be the false leader of Israel who sells out, like King Herod, Israel to the Antichrist. Do you realize that Judas happens to Israel? Judas knew Jesus. Judas walked with Jesus. Judas talked with Jesus. And all the time he had a secret agenda, according to John, who loved Jesus. And Judas sold out Jesus. Did Donald Trump sell you out? Think about that for a while. Think carefully. Because according to the Republican Party, they got it handled. They're not giving him what he wants. They're telling him what to do. He's setting up all kinds of people that he says, Oh, well, you know, I got this guy for that, and I got for that, you know, and all that. But guess what? None of those actions can happen without Senate and White House approval. They have to rubber stamp whatever Donald does. The senators in the Roman Empire killed Caesar. They stabbed him, literally, and took back the power. Because at one time, the president decided he had stepped too far. He declared himself God, and the senator said, uh-uh. So well, they killed him. Yeah. Brutus, Julius. Think of a lot of other senators and how they died. Think of the kings in Israel, how they died. Think of a lot of other kingdoms and how they died. Think about where we are today. Think about whether or not you've been sold a bill of goods and now it's going back to business as usual because there was a warning in that candidacy, that election process, that manipulation of your interest and passion that took you away from the gospel, that made you say, oh, this man is a Christian. I can tell you that calling Donald Trump a Christian is declaring the Antichrist. You cannot tell me a man is a Christian and he comes out and says the things he says. He 
Christians don't come out and say, I can murder and get away with it. Christians don't come out and kid about that. Christians don't come out and say it was just a joke. Christians don't assault other women. Because if they do, you are the fault. You are. You're serving the Antichrist. You're following evil. You are the spirit of Antichrist fulfilled. Now, Donald Trump isn't, no offense, he's not the Antichrist. Neither was previous president or previous after that, before that. Uh, president Ford, President Bush, both, and President Obama. None of them were the Antichrist or even a type of them because they didn't do things the Antichrist does. Donald Trump did during his election. During his election process, guess what? He said things that were the direct revelation of the spirit of the Antichrist at work at a man, in a man, causing the man to say things that he shouldn't have said. That should be a warning. Benjamin Netanyahu lying for you. At least 10 years I know of that I can track about Iran. Has lied and lied and lied and lied. Now he changed his tune. Now he's like, oh, well, the world is against us. Interesting. Crying wolf with Iran for 10 years isn't going to get you sympathy. It's going to get you reverse of what you think. He lied about Iran. Iran's trying to build it. They didn't do it. They can't do it. They won't be able to do it. It's not going to happen the way you think. Bottom line. We Americans created the Ayatollah Khomeini and his current government. We were supporting the Shah of Iran. We created a dictatorship by supporting them and promoting them and causing it to backfire on us. We did that country after country after country after country in the Middle East. And then we said, oh, but we still got our friend Israel. Do you really? Do you really? Remember, I told you, in a previous war, in the 60s, I think it was 67 war, Israel bombed the boat and sank it because all Americans died in it. I mean, it wasn't even a question of did it an accident. It was a target. And history records it. Look it up. With a prophet. It's just letting you know where Israel stands. The Jews were Jews. Sorry. You know? Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, will come over here and say all kinds of things. Because he knows as he was a journalist, as he was one of those news reporters, he knows how to manipulate. He knows how to use American knife pay. He knows what Americans want to hear, and he tells them what they want to hear so he can get that money support and go back to Israel and keep getting elected. Then in Israel, check it out. See what he says to his own parties and parties than what he says on a video release to the world or a report to Jerusalem Post. See what he does. Pretty obvious. So we're back to square one. We know what Israel was. We know what Israel, when the nation became a nation, at least you've been given some information that you can research. World Zionist Congress, Israel became a nation not in 48, which for you prophecy scholars ought to be going, whoa, slap me silly. I didn't see that coming. And I know most didn't because they're thinking in prophecy, Gentile world, not prophecy, Jewish world. In the Gentile world, some things happen. In the Jewish world, some things happen. In the world as a whole, God brings it circular around and around and around and around. Boom. Until it's actually fulfilled. The pieces are in place. There's no doubt about how far away from God Israel is today. My God, can it get any farther away? They're almost ready to pull the plug, to burn their bridges, to attack something, bomb something, do something that God will not sanction, that God will not be with them, that will not be, oh, well now, you know, look at them, you know, they're going to be delivered from it. You think so? Or will it be just like King Herod? Bring me this Jesus. Come on now, do some tricks. Show me. I want to use you. I want to abuse you. I want to see for myself and my friends here that I made a party with what you can do. 
inherit a Jew. Hasmonean dynasty, admitted, but a Jew. Not pure, but a Jew. So, where are you at? What are you looking at? Is it? I got news what you should be doing. And it's not called, you know, pray that, oh God, you know, bless Israel and oh, the bless you. So I want to bless it and I bless Israel in the name of God. No, the, the proverb says pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Because the peace of Jerusalem is Jesus. You were meant to evangelize. You're meant to still evangelize. You're meant to be evangelistic. You're meant to go out and share the good news, Jesus. The good news, Israel. You are going to suffer. Yes. And you know you will. Because you tell the Jews to get something because they have such a deal. You know, like we don't know. You tell them that they're going to get blessed. They're going to go, ah, you know, what do you want? They don't believe you at all. None whatsoever. You tell Israel that it's their land. They're not going to listen to that. They're like, no, you're just a Christian. You tell them what Jesus said, love your enemies. The humanist and a Jew will automatically listen. You tell them that the Son of God is coming. They're not going to really listen. If you tell them about Jesus and what Jesus has done for you, they're jealous. You see, you're supposed to provoke a Jew to jealousy so that they would want what you got. But you don't got anything a Jew wants. I've looked around and I've listened to people tell me about their faith, and I said, why would I ever in my right mind choose to follow you or your God? And I'm talking about Christians. I don't want that. I want this. And what I found, I followed. It was called the love of God. It was seen and evidenced in the people that were doing it. I wanted that, and I got it. And it was like, now, I look around and I go, do I send the messianic legalist who's trying to add the law to his grace and become some kind of super Jew orthodox because he puts on a kippah and he puts on a prayer shawl and he says, I want to do the seven feet. Tell a Jew that and he goes, I don't want to do this every day. Matter of fact, I already feast every day. I already party hard. Tell me what the set of feasts mean. Okay, you know, you might be a little interested intellectually, but it's virtually you ain't gonna follow. You see, what you tell a Jew isn't what you say, it's what you do. You go over there and just love on someone, you know, by just love, it's like, well, you know, we'll use you. You know, because after all, that's what the Israeli spies did. The Mossad was that send the women in. Hey, it worked on us, it'll work with the world. So they used women as spies to sleep with men because men will spill their guts. They get looking, they get sex, but they are satisfied. Same thing with telling you what you want to hear. Jewish spies are very successful because they use someone else in order to do a dirty work. Just like you're being used to promote Israel in a way that Israel wants to be seen, but that's not what Israel is. So, when the future of Israel comes to life, it happens in the Great Tribulation. I didn't want to talk too much about that time because you know a lot about it. You don't know who the two prophets are, which I don't understand why. The two witnesses are, which I don't understand why. But it's Moses and Elijah, which is obvious to anyone that studies it. If you're Jewish, Who's going to come? We set a table or chair out for, for Elijah. Who gave us the law? Jesus or Moses? It ain't gonna be Jesus that's gonna fall down dead, you know, and die and you know, be on the pavement and raised for the day. It'd be interesting. I mean, you could almost make a cult out of that. I could, but maybe you can. But Moses and Elijah are coming to witness to letting those who realize not the world, not the Knesset, not Netanyahu, not the people in charge, but the poor people, the everyday people. Even the Arabs will come to salvation. Even the Jews will come to salvation. People will be going, and they'll see around the world, because they might be in Hebrew. Who knows? They might be speaking in Yiddish. They might speak in Hebrew. They might speak in every language. Who knows? They might be speaking in tongues. I don't know. The point is, will the world see them? By the time they die, they will. It doesn't mean that all the time of their message will they be seen. They call down fire from heaven. All of a sudden, you're going to get a whole cult of Christians turning into some kind of, they want to be Jewish, you know, routine, just like they did the Messianic movement. Ah, we want to be Jewish. So the Seventh-day Adventists left. There were so many Seventh-day Adventists that the church itself 
lost about one third of its population of Seventh-day Adventists and jumped into the Messianic movement and failed miserably within 20 years. Some of them are still hanging around in it and now they're supposed to grab on it. Makes you really wonder about some things, you know. You were a Seventh-day Adventist and now you, you deny that, but you tell me now that you're always been Jewish. You, you won't admit that you were once a Seventh-day Adventist and then suddenly after the Messianic movement. Now we're Messianic? All right, you say so. Most legalists you can trace back to religious indoctrination of one kind, but it ain't Jewish. Sorry, Jews don't go back into legalism. Uh huh. Once they find grace, they don't want to go there. Sorry. Um, enjoying a certain amount, like okay, I know um, if you've been assimilated Jew, like hey, you know, yeah, you know, okay, we we enjoy a certain amount of you know practicing or observing you know certain. Tradition, which I, I, you know, I'd like to in the Jewish culture. I'm not going to do it in a Gentile culture. They worship it. I mean, you can watch it. They, they, they'll worship worship. They'll worship worship leaders. They worship Israel. They worship the prime minister. At least in Jewish culture, we're used to say the rabbi's not always right. Yeah, you question it. So, the future of Israel? Yeah. All Israel shall be saved. Not all Israel is saved. Because Israel is going to repent finally of her sins in the end of the Great Tribulation after nearly dying. Period. And seeing even Jesus ride in on a white horse and even then not knowing who he is. Because during the Great Tribulation, even God blinds everyone's eyes. And then it says that they mourn. I don't know if you realize this, but that's not like mourning, like saying, oh, bummer, dude, you know, I just had a bad rap for, you know, 2,000 years, you know, and now, you know, I feel sorry that, you know, this is my God, you know, these are your wounds. That's not what it's talking about. We're talking some serious, serious mourning that you probably have never seen or will ever see again in a nation like this. In Israel, we do things, you know, to commemorate mourning, like the Holocaust, stop, ah, silence. Wait for the silence, you know, take a moment of silence. Yeah. A little different than Gentiles, because we're pretty stiff necked, we can stubbornly do it, you know. But, the future is humiliation, not exaltation. Israel doesn't go into the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, as a shining example, but a miserable example. Now let me give you one more. When God Almighty, the King of kings and the Lord of Lords, sits down at his throne and he separates the nations as he separates the sheep from the goats. Where will America be? A goat? Or a sheep? I'm going to give you more of a hint than what Jesus said. It's just a hint. Doesn't mean it's the actual fulfillment. Doesn't mean it's a word from the Lord. It doesn't mean that it's even spiritually right or wrong. But isn't it interesting that in the parable, besides Jesus telling us what it means, is that in as much as you fed me and you clothed me and you took care of me, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me, so enter into your rest. Come, blessed of my father. And as much as you didn't do it unto me, you know, you were taking care of yourself, you were selfish, self centered, you know. Echocentric, it was all about you and not about everyone else. Well, go to hell. Patience. One other thing, not said. Why sheep? Why goats? Now I'm Jewish, so I don't really see myself as sheep. I'm sorry. I can, I can fill a goat, no problem. Most people say, goat. But what are you? In that parable, not because you've been, oh, those poor people, they took care of them. Oh, you know, send them some money, God's sake, you know. That's not what I'm saying. I don't mean about doing it as unto the Lord. I mean in your everyday existence. Are you a sheep or are you a goat? In Israel, I can tell you today, if like, you know, you push one, you get shoved back. There's no turning here to sheep. 
They're slapping them down before they even get a chance to turn the other cheek. If you don't do it first, they'll do it to you. The nature of Israel. Christians today, in this new election, have a choice. There's a degree of separation happening in 2017. You're going one way, or you're going the other way. And it's going to get wider and wider and wider. And it's going to be more obvious, are you a sheep? Or are you a goat? Are you being led to the slaughter? And that's what it means. I'm asking you that. As a Christian. Now, I already know what the world is doing. And there's a lot of humanists that would say, you know, you can find a few, you know, then Buddhists, or maybe the Confucius, or maybe the Dalai Lama, who you would say, ah, he's a sheep. Careful. He pulled some stunts that might not be quite so sheep like. But let me ask you your nature, your direction of the perspective of who you're becoming and what you're becoming and how you're becoming, like Israel, are you becoming like a sheep or are you becoming like a goat? Is the nature of being a sheep? Offensive. Are you offended by that? You want to just, I'm not a sheep, I'm not a doormat, I'm a man, and I got a gun, and I'm going to shoot your ass. And you're a goat. You have to defend yourself. Ah, I got to defend myself. If I don't, who will? And you're a goat. Goats defend themselves. Goats take care of themselves. Matter of fact, goats are pretty independent. They work together cooperatively. Rarely, if ever. And goats are pretty, I can do it myself. And they got horns. That should be a big warning sign. How did Satan get horns? Goats. Started looking at goats. Started looking at the nature of a goat. Satanic is all about being violent. 100%. It's all about being self-defense as far as God your defense. It's all about being self-sufficient as far as being God-sufficient. It's all about this degree of separation that's happening. Are you becoming more like a sheep or a goat? Israel today has quit being sheep. We are no longer six million Jews that would be led to the slaughter in Holocaust. We are no longer a people that would be herded up like sheep. We are no longer a people that would have been taken to the land and wipe out 100% of a full generation or two or three. And yet, what would you do? Because I've got news for you. As the good shepherd, and he's going to come as a king, and he's going to sit down on his throne, and he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. What are you to do? What do you see Israel as, and why are you letting them be what they are? Because I know you're proud of, oh, look at those Israeli women. Man, they're army women. Is that what God created women to be? They are tough. They are rough. They can kick some butt. Look at Israel's Air Force. Man, they are dropping people like flies. They can knock everything out of the sky. That what God called them to be. What did God call Israel, the land and the people, to be? What did he say, I want you to be? Did he tell them to go out and become the strongest of nations? Warlike. Protecting themselves lest they get wiped out. Or did he raise up other nations to be the salvation? That they would always be the least of all nations. The least of all people. The least in the midst of the greatest of greaters and yet still survive. Were they? Are they? Have they? Can they be called the light of the world? The light of the nations? Or are they in fact the last of the inner of the kingdom of God? I got news for you. Where are you? What are you? Have you become more of a sheep or more of a goat? That is how you're seeing Israel. You as a goat will see Israel one way. You as a sheep will see Israel another way. But if you choose to not be either one and you rise up to a station where you suddenly realize, I'm not a goat. Because I, I, I will turn the other cheek and I'll even die rather than protect myself. 
I don't have to worry about putting myself in jeopardy because God protects me from even being caused by somebody breaking into my house. They're not done that God protects my house because I'm following him. I don't get put in that position of what would you do if your children were threatened. Guess what? Jesus didn't send a band of angels to protect the children that were his neighbors and in the same land, but they were killed and slaughtered for Jesus. Or let me put it a different way for you. When Jesus came, he let those children die the first time. What do you think he's going to do the second time? Spare the children? There's a false teaching about rapture that, that the babies are going to get raptured. All babies get raptured. No. They get killed. Pretty simple. Antichrist comes along and slaughters them just like he did the first time. He didn't do it the second time. You see, that's what we're trying to say. Everything's going to happen exactly the way it was written. I like those things that say it is written. Because it is written, which means to me, it's going to happen. The things Jesus said aren't metaphors and similes. They're going to happen. The ones that are similes and metaphors are still going to happen. Exactly the way he said it. And still be a metaphor and simile. It's still going to happen. So, in the next hour, we'll talk about some of these things that are happening already. The ghosts. And some of these things that aren't happening. The sheep. We'll be looking at some things that are what we should be doing and how we should be living and some of the things that we are doing and we aren't living. As a matter of fact, in the next hour, maybe we'll find that admitting to being a goat helps us to become a sheep and to find that we have a good shepherd who lays down his life 